Hello, uh, and welcome to Roger Williams University School of Law's virtual symposium on justice for all transformative, transformative gender law. My name is Gregory Bowman, and I have the honor and privilege of serving as the Dean of our fine law school, and I'm very excited to start us off today. This annual Justice for All issue of the Law Review uh, and the accompanying symposium were created several years ago by the board of editors of our Law Review. And the symposium and the issue are stirring examples, I think, of what can happen when you have bright, talented, mission-focused student leadership and how that leadership of the students can make a law school that is already very good even better. So I'm pleased to welcome you this morning. I would like to start us off by reading our law school's land and labor acknowledgement. As we begin our program today, I want to take a moment to reflect on the lands on which we reside. We are coming from many places and we want to acknowledge the ancestral homelands and traditional territories of indigenous and native peoples who have been here since time immemorial and to recognize that we must continue to build our solidarity and kinship with Native peoples across the Americas and across the globe. Roger Williams University School of Law is located in Bristol, Rhode Island, and so we acknowledge and we honor the Narragansett and Poconobic people, as well as Soames, the original land, name of the land on which our campus resides. We also acknowledge that this country would not exist if not for the free enslaved labor of Black people. And we recognize that the town of Bristol and the very land on which our campus resides have benefited significantly from the trade of enslaved people from Africa. The economy of New England, of Rhode Island, and more specifically of Bristol, was built from wealth generated through the triangle trade of human lives. During this time of ongoing national reckoning with our history of slavery and the disparate treatment of Black people, we honor the legacy of the African diaspora and the black lives, knowledge and skills stolen due to violence and white supremacy. As we gather here virtually today, the movement for justice and liberation is building in our country, yet many are still being met with violence and even being killed, while other people in our country actively work to stand in the way of progress. As upholders of justice, our hope is to become agents of change for members of our society who have been met with violence, physical, mental, emotional, through our privilege. And as upholders of justice, we believe that our students, who soon will be practitioners of law, can be and already are agents of change as well. So thank you again for being here. We really appreciate you taking the time to be with us for today's exciting day. It is now my pleasure to turn the virtual podium over to Eddie Lee Schaub, who is the president of the Rhode Island Women's Bar Association. Thank you very much, Dean Bowman, and good morning. Um, as the Dean said, my name is Eti Lee Schaub. I'm the president of the Rhode Island Women's Bar Association. I'm also a senior assistant city solicitor for the city of Providence. And although I'm not a Roger Williams alum, I'm so proud and glad for the relationship that the Women's Bar Association has been fostering and will be continuing to foster with the law school. Uh, I'm also delighted to have been invited to speak at the beginning of the symposium and introduce, and into, introduce a few of the uh, background and history of the law school's law review, as well as the Justice for All program. So the Roger Williams University Law Review is a relatively young organization, not unlike the law school itself. Their first issue was published in the spring of 1996. The Law Review is a student-run organization that publishes three journals of legal scholarship each academic year. Student editors run the Law Review and are responsible for content, timely publication, and all other organizational decisions. The Law Review usually publishes three issues throughout the academic year. First, the winter issue is devoted to topics with a national focus. Second, the spring issue revolves around topics germane to the Rhode Island legal landscape, including a survey of new Rhode Island law, and includes student reviews of recent legislative enactments 
as well as an analysis of significant Rhode Island Supreme Court opinions. As the only law review in Rhode Island, the law review is uniquely positioned and qualified to publish scholarship in this field. As a quick aside, I can personally attest to the quality of that legal review, and I have personally relied upon a number of law review articles regarding Rhode Island law in my practice. Um, and finally, the law review publishes an issue featuring articles from academic symposia at the law school. At the law school. <clears throat> the law review is ultimately committed to promoting and enabling both honest and full discussion of legally significant topics on a national and local level. Editions incorporate a comprehensive range of articles and essays from professors, judges, and practitioners. In addition, the Law Review displays student work in the form of comments and notes. Second year students also write the Survey of Rhode Island Law, a section that has become a resource for local practitioners in the state, like myself. <clears throat> a little bit about the history of the Justice for All program. The phrase justice for all dates back to the founding of our country but it has become increasingly clear that many groups of people are often left out of the all category. An individual's race, sex, sexual orientation, gender identity, religion, citizenship, ability, age, and or socioeconomic status are just a few of the factors that can lock an individual out from receiving equal treatment in our justice system. People in those groups have limited access to resources like lawyers, legal services, and legal education, which undermines the very core principle of justice that is at the essence of the United States Constitution. Less than 30 years after its founding, the Roger Williams Law Review sought to increase their call for pieces oriented around social justice and founded the Justice for All Journal, an annual publication that lives within the Roger Williams Law Review. To support that mission, the 2020-2021 Law Review Editorial Board created two new roles within the Law Review Editorial Board to promote the journal and select timely topics for both the publication and the annual symposium. The Justice for All journal is now approaching its third year. The articles in the Justice for All journal range from traditional to non-traditional pieces. The goal is to make it accessible, not only in a physical sense, but in such a way that people from all backgrounds can understand its content. The journal prides itself on publishing timely content from a variety of sources that are not solely legal in nature. Symposium Event supports that mission, and we hope will continue to promote the purpose of justice for all. So this year's symposium event focuses on transformative gender law. The event will have three portions, two panelists, two panels and a keynote speaker. The first panel will focus on Title IX. Title IX has had such an impact that is rarely considered in its fullness. Primarily its impact on athletics, education funding, opportunities, and sexual assault. This panel brings theory and practice together to reflect on the deep impact of this statute in our legal system and American life. Our keynote speaker, Zakia Thomas, will discuss the legal and political history of the ERA and why it matters now more than ever, especially to protect bodily autonomy and what lawyers can do to help. The second panel will focus on the transformation of the law in regards to transgender rights and the effects on transgender individuals. There will be a brief discussion on the projection into the future of those rights. So for everyone paying attention at home uh, on, in Zoom land, um, that was basically the canned portion of my speaking portion to introduce the panel and to introduce what the day was gonna look like and to give a bit of background. I was now invited to have the opportunity to talk to all of you about a little bit of an anecdotal experience, my experience with gender rights, my experience with the ERA, any, anything that might be uh, relevant to the symposia. And as president of the Rhode Island Women's Bar Association, my cup runneth over with stories that I can share with you about access to justice based on an individual's gender, gender identity, and gender presentation. Um, where to start? 
Uh, so first and foremost, I did have the pleasure and opportunity of representing the state of Rhode Island as a special assistant attorney general and defended the attorney general on an ERA challenge. I, I'm so happy that we are discussing today the Equal Rights Amendment and its impact and where it currently stands. There has been a number of litigation, a, a number of cases throughout the country brought to try and seek to codify the ERA because it was passed by a number of states. Um, the lawsuit, unfortunately, that was brought against the attorney general was not the type, in my legal opinion, that would have been sufficient to provide the women in Rhode Island the type of protection that the actual ERA, once codified, would provide. Um, I mean, we all understand, for, for those of us who are women, who are friends of women in the legal profession, we all know those experiences where women are in the legal profession, either undercut, underrepresented, or undermined by virtue of their gender presentation. Something very recently that just happened to me. Um, I am on a case that has been receiving a little bit of local news. I have been seated at council table and a local paper of record did not acknowledge that I was an attorney at the table. Now it might've been an oversight, it might've been an accident, or it might've been by virtue of my gender presentation and the paradigm that is difficult for individuals to recognize that women can in fact be lawyers in the justice system. It, was not surprising to me considering the judge is a man and every other lawyer in the room was a man. In my career and life and experiences, I've also had the opportunity to work with a number of individuals from the transgender community, individuals who I respect and care for. And the reality is, is that gender law and gender transformation and, and respecting the rights of those individuals is really the core of respecting those individuals as humans at all. In Rhode Island, uh, as a member of the Women's Bar Association, we recognize a woman in law every year to receive the Ada Sawyer Award. Ada Sawyer was the first woman in Rhode Island to be recognized as an attorney. And the way that she became recognized as an attorney is that she had to sue for the right to be acknowledged as a human at all in order to qualify to sit for the bar and become admitted. This wasn't 300 years ago before the spanning of our country. It wasn't, it was in the 1920s. I mean, only a little more than 100 years later, we're still dealing with equity issues and equality issues and the ability to access justice by virtue of gender and gender presentation. I honestly could keep going on and on and on about the issues, frustrations that I have felt but I am so grateful to be part of the Rhode Island legal community. I'm so grateful to have been invited to speak, to speak to all of you about some of the issues here today and to introduce what appears to be a tremendous panel of speakers and an amazing program by Roger Williams here today. And so uh, without further ado and without taking up even more of your time, can you tell I'm a litigator and like the sound of my own voice, I will now turn it over to the editor-in-chief of the Roger Williams Law Review, Stephanie Fisher. Thank you again for allowing me to speak. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. Good morning, everyone. My name is Stephanie Fisher, and I'm the editor-in-chief of the Roger Williams Law Review. On behalf of the entire Law Review, I'd like to welcome you to our event. Thank you for taking the time to attend. I'd like to also extend a very sincere thank you to the faculty and staff at the law school who continue to support our efforts. We could never do this without you. And most especially, thank you to our Justice for All editor, Ms. Levy Friedman, and our Justice for All research and development editor, Ms. Stalen. They both worked tirelessly for this event, have been the main point of contact for all of our speakers. Thank you both so much. Today's event is a webinar. We will have two panels and a keynote speaker, and the agenda for today's event denoting the times for each panel and the breaks is located on the registration page. You can download that for additional details. In addition, biographical information for each speaker and moderator is listed on the registration page. Um, to make note, this event has been approved for five continuing legal education credits as well. After the event, a recording of the entire webinar will be available on the school's YouTube channel. Throughout the webinar event, attendees will have the opportunity to submit questions to the speakers. To do so, please submit your questions in the question and answer feature, which should be located at the bottom toolbar of your Zoom screen. We will submit those questions to the speakers as time permits towards the end of each segment. 
Our first panel will begin shortly at 10 a.m. We will take a brief break until then. Again, thank you for attending and we hope you enjoy the event. Good morning. My name is Hillary Levy Friedman. I'm a 3L here at Roger Williams University School of Law and I'm the editor of the Justice for All edition. And I am very honored that I was able to plan this session today on Title IX. Now, Title IX is only 37 words. It reads, no person in the United States shall, on the basis of sex, be excluded from, be excluded from participation in, be denied the benefits of, or be subjected to discrimination under any education program or activity receiving federal financial assistance. Now, within those roughly three dozen words are a world of meanings to different people and in different contexts. But since Congress added those words a little over 50 years ago, the ways in which education, especially for those who identify as women, has changed in largely positive but also some negative ways, is numerically staggering at times. Today, what our panelists will be addressing uh, is where Title IX has been, where it is now, and where they think it might be going, not just in American society, but also in their own professional lives. We're super fortunate to have Professor Monica Teixeira D'Souza guide this conversation. Professor Teixeira D'Souza is a professor of law here at Roger Williams. She arrived last year and since then has become an indispensable faculty member, beloved by her students for her wisdom and her wit and the care and attention she brings to every lecture and every student. Before entering legal, academic, legal academia, she was a staff attorney at Rhode Island Legal Services, where she began practicing in 2002 uh, as a Skadden Fellow after graduating from Georgetown Law. She created a school-based legal clinic at her former elementary school in Pawtucket, Rhode Island, where she represented parents and students in school discipline and special education classes, as well as public benefits and eviction defense matters. Professor Teixeira D'Souza specializes in issues of equity and education law and policy. In 2014, she took a sabbatical from academic teaching. At the time, she was a tenured professor at New England Law, and she worked as a volunteer attorney in the Public Benefits Unit at Rhode Island Legal Services. Her current pro bono work includes volunteering in the Housing Unit at Rhode Island Legal Services through a collaboration with the law school's Feinstein Center for Pro Bono and Experiential Education. So thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. And I place this panel in your extremely capable hands, Professor De Teixeira D'Souza. Thank you so much, Hillary. It's really a pleasure to be here with all of you and to have this incredible honor of introducing our panelists. I'd like to begin by introducing Lynette Leibinger. Lynette Leibinger is a longtime civil rights litigator in Rhode Island. After a two-year clerkship with federal judge Raymond Patin, Labinger joined a law firm founded by Milton Stanzler, who was himself instrumental in creating the Rhode Island chapter of the ACLU. Labinger continued her advocacy, championing constitutional and civil rights litigation throughout her years of private practice in a 35-year association with her law partner, John Roney. And since 2018, she has limited her practice to cases sponsored by the ACLU of Rhode Island. Labinger has served, Attorney Labinger has served as a trial and appellate counsel in a wide range of cases championing constitutional and civil rights. In 1980, Labinger and GLAD founder John Ward successfully challenged a local high school's refusal to permit a male student to bring a male date to his senior prom. Labinger has represented the plaintiff class in the landmark Title IX sex discrimination case, challenging the treatment of women athletes at Brown University, Cohen v. Brown University. She has litigated many high profile civil rights cases in Rhode Island, including cases involving discrimination, based on race, gender, age, disability, reproductive rights, and First Amendment rights. One of these cases included representation of a teenager in vindicating her First Amendment right not to have a religious display in her high school and representing a prison inmate in vindicating his right to practice his religion 
while incarcerated. She currently represents a class of three to five-year-old children who have special needs to ensure that Providence provides them federally mandated education and other related services. Labinger also served as a judge of the housing court of the city of Providence from 2004 to 2019. And she is a fellow of the American College of Trial Lawyers, as well as a member and secretary of the Board of Trustees of the New England Institute of Technology. Of the numerous awards that Labinger has received for her civil rights advocacy, uh, one of those included a recognition in 2019 by the Roger Williams University Law Review um, that Lynette Labinger is indeed a gender equity champion and she was a recipient of the law school's honorary doctor of law degrees in 2021. So it's an incredible honor to be able to be here uh, with attorney Lynette Labinger. Next, I would like to also introduce Dr. Jennifer Stanley. Dr. Stanley is the Associate Dean for Student Life and the Title IX Coordinator at Roger Williams University. Dr. Stanley joined our community, the Roger community in 1997, and she climbed the ranks of residence life, serving as campus, um, as the director of the Gender and Sexuality Center during her tenure. Dr. Stanley's commitment to violence prevention has been demonstrated through her direction of the RWU Green Dot Bystander Intervention Efforts. Dr. Stanley has chaired the campus uh, Title IX Task Force, serving as a member of the bias response team, and also uh, in her implementation of the National Association of Student Personnel Administrators Culture of Respect Program. This was a two-year campus self-assessment to enhance sexual assault prevention efforts. Dr. Stanley is a voice for higher education leaders, serving as a member of the NASPA Region 1 Advisory Board since 2000. This included a three-year national appointment to NASPA's Center for Women. Dr. Stanley also serves on the National Board of Directors of the Silent Witness Initiative, a volunteer organization addressing issues of relationship violence and represents RWU as a member of the Rhode Island Cross Campus Learning Collaborative for Sexual Pro Violence Prevention. Recently, Dr. Stanley was featured on a podcast, Public Health Out Loud, focusing on sexual assault prevention on college campuses. And she is the 2022 recipient of NASPA's Regional Institutional Leadership Award. Thank you, Dr. Stanley, for being here with us and for all this incredible work that you are doing. Next, I'd like to introduce Susan Ware. Susan Ware is an independent scholar, prolific author, specializes in 20th century US history, women's history, and biography. She's written numerous books, including Why They Marched, Untold Stories of the Women Who Fought for the Right to Vote. She's also written Game, Set, Match, Billie Jean King and the Revolution in Women's Sports, and Title IX, A Brief History with Documents. From 2012 to 2022, Professor Ware also served as general editor of the of the excuse me American National Biography and it's just amazing as i list all these incredible accomplishments that all of you have had i can't tell you how happy the students are that you are here today this is something that the campus community our law school community has really been looking forward to and I wanted to just give a little bit of background to the first question that I have for each of you. And it's a quote that I often share with my students, but it applies so well to Title IX and really the seismic impact 
that Title IX has had in our lives. There's a legal theorist. His name is Roscoe uh, Pound, and he has a quote that is often associated uh, with his work, and it is, law makes habits. It does not wait for them to grow. And so when we look at Title IX, a law that was um, enacted in 1972, prohibiting sex-based discrimination in programs and activities in educational institutions that receive federal funding. And then we look at all of the changes that have flowed from this law throughout the last half century. As I think back to what we've just learned about the incredible work that all of you um, have been doing in this arena for decades, I wonder if you can uh, tell us a little bit about not only what you've witnessed in terms of these seismic changes related to Title IX, but also how your work has created many of these changes, right? You've all been working to ensure that Title IX has really formed new habits in our uh, society. So it's a bit of a broader question, but I'd like to first uh, turn it over to attorney uh, Lynette Labinger. Thank you. Um, I so what we'd like to do, what we'd like to do at this point is actually with the same uh, question, rather a bit broad question, but to give the panelists really an opportunity to talk a bit about how they have viewed this work in their lives through their experience um, and the work, tr tremendous work that they have done to make sure that Title IX has had these meaningful uh, reforms. I would like to next turn to Dr. Stanley. Dr. Stanley, thank you so much for being here, and I'll turn it over to you. Absolutely. Thank you for um, inviting me to be a part of uh, this amazing day. Um, and what a great question and a big question, right? So um, I think there are several spaces that uh, where I see that I have power to shape new habits. Um, while the current federal regulations really tend to be reactive in their approach to addressing harassment and discrimination, especially as it relates to sexual misconduct, um, I think I find that there's significant opportunity for college communities to change culture in the spirit of Title IX through prevention work, uh, specifically bystander intervention. And there's many models. Uh, I think every school you know, has, has some model that they use. Here at Roger Williams, we use a program called the Green Dot Model. And we've been, I'm gonna say this is about our seventh year working with that model. And um, we train uh, pretty much everyone, uh, new students, returning students, faculty, staff. We use um, short modules, uh, full day workshops, uh, and really try to, um, you know, give some perspective and understanding of Title IX, but in a way that folks understand uh, practically wh what we mean, how to um, understand how to get support when they need it, or how to recognize concerns when they see it coming up in other places. And um, honestly, like an anecdotally, I see truly that um, more students are speaking up, they're stepping in, they're looking out for themselves and others. Um, which, you know, really what more can you ask for but that rather than, you know, rather than waiting for somebody to come forward with a complaint, having our community say, hey, something's wrong here. Let me step in and try to prevent the issue before it escalates to something else. Um, and while, you know, that truly might not eradicate the need for Title IX offices or Title IX coordinators, um, it certainly has the power to make our campuses safer. Um, those are skills that um, we all take with us as citizens of the world. And I think um, it's an important place to start. And hopefully we can expand those efforts in K through 12. So it's not uh, waiting for um, folks to be college age or you know adult learners to first be exposed to uh, bystander intervention. What can we be doing K through 12 you know, to make that change a lot earlier? Um, Additionally, as mentioned in the, the intro, I do a lot of um, statewide uh, collaborative work. And I think that that's truly important because while my focus and priority is to the folks in my campus community, you know, students at Roger Williams aren't just gonna stay here. They're gonna visit friends at other schools. They're gonna be in other places at conferences uh, or in their research and studies. And knowing that I've got this collaborative partnership with others across the state, I think is really important. Um, it gives an opportunity to assess trends, 
to uh, collaborate in best practices. Um, in particular, the Cross Campus Collaborative, we meet monthly and we actually share in ongoing learning and professional development in an effort to enhance all of our skills and make sure we're bringing the best back to our home campuses. And that group in particular also has a student um, committee that works in conjunction with them. So there's student representation throughout our state of students working together to highlight their Title IX policies on their campuses, highlight um, resources, and also help us find places where there might be gaps in the supports or um, other things that we need to address on our campus, which I think is really a terrific opportunity for students uh, at all levels. Um, and, you know, so I really feel that the proactive piece is the place where I can probably make the most, you know, shape the most culture. But um, another place is that I think sometimes uh, we forget that pregnant and parenting students also are afforded protections under Title IX. And um, a lot of smaller schools don't have very robust policies or uh, procedures embedded into their supports on campus. I think if you look to larger state schools or community colleges, you may see um, you know, those, those supports a little bit more explicitly. So I think that's a place where we all have um, opportunity moving forward to make sure that our campus policies um, address supports needed for uh, pregnant and parenting students, as well as the sexual misconduct, which sometimes I think gets the, the biggest um, focus of Title IX, as well as um, equity in all other uh, aspects of, of, of gender and sex, whether it's athletics or in other spaces. And so, yeah, I think there's a lot of work still to be done and uh, hopefully we'll continue to make some positive change there. Thank you so much for that, Dr. Stanley. And it was so interesting that you picked up on this piece of the pregnant and parenting students because we know with changes to the incoming demographic of students at colleges and universities tending to track a little bit older maybe than they have in previous generations, some of those issues are going to be even more front and center than perhaps they have been in the past. So thank you so much for highlighting that important issue. Next, I would like to uh, turn to uh, Susan Weir, who is also going to take on this, uh, this larger question of the habits that have been changed through Title IX in your work, in your experience. If you could just tell us a little bit about what you have seen. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks for inviting me and greetings from New Hampshire. And um, my pronouns are she and hers which I couldn't quite figure out how to do on my Zoom na name plan. So I'm, I'm sorry. Um, but to address the question at hand about helping to ensure that Title IX forms new habits in our society, uh, I want to put on my historian slash biographer's hat and talk about somebody who actually did just that. And her name is Bernice Sandler, always known as Bunny Sandler, who's often called the godmother of Title IX, and she died four years ago uh, at the age of 90. And perhaps some of you had the chance to work with her over the years, and if so, uh, you know what a force of nature she was. Uh, and here's her Title IX backstory. In 1969, after receiving her PhD from the University of Maryland, she wanted to get a teaching job uh, and her department had multiple openings, but she was passed over for all of them because as a colleague told her, and this is a direct quote, she came on too strong for a woman. And those five words really launched her career as a feminist. And that year, Sandler joined the now defunct Women's Equity Action League, also called WHEEL. And casting about for ways to combat discrimination in higher, higher education, like she had clearly uh, experienced, she discovered that a 1965 executive order covering racial discrimination in federal contracts had been amended to include women in 1967. And she called this her eureka moment. She says she even screamed out with excitement when she was reading it, I think in a footnote, um, because it meant that a federal law prohibited sex discrimination in colleges and universities, 
which were not covered by Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. So based on Sandler's discovery, Wheel filed a class action suit in January 1970 against all the colleges and universities in the country. I love this. You know, let's not just go after one or two. Let's take them all on. Uh, and it alleged an industry-wide pattern of discrimination against women, especially in admissions, hiring, promotions, and salary. And spurred in large part by Sandler's research and activism, in June and July of 1970, again, this is two years before the law is passed, Representative Edith Green, a Democrat from Oregon, held seven days of hearings on sex discrimination in higher education. And she then, very smartly, uh, hired Sandler to edit the written record of the hearings. And to the naysayers who doubted that sex discrimination was a problem on campus, um, Bunny said that they kept saying, oh, there's no discrimination. Send us proof. Then maybe we'll, we'll believe you. The two thick volumes of testimony and appendices, which are probably in your library if it still has the physical copy, uh, filled with what she termed horror stories of women's inequitable treatment on campus, which were frankly just the way things were. Things like uh, Attorney Lavenger talked about the admissions quotas and other things. Um, and it established beyond a doubt that this was a legitimate and pressing issue in education, one for which there was really no current recourse. And a direct result was the passage of the Education Amendments of 1972, co-sponsored by Representative Green and Senator Birch Bayh, a Democrat from Indiana, which contained the 37-word Title IX um, prohibiting sex discrimination. And the law passed on June 8, 1972, and was signed into law by President Richard Nixon on June 23rd. And if you're up on your Watergate chronology, you'll notice that this is the same month as the break-in at Democratic headquarters that led to Nixon's downfall. So there was a lot going on in Washington in June of 1972. But to go back to my, my original point, the original impetus behind the law was the widespread discrimination women faced in all aspects of the educational experience, from students to professors to administrators. Athletics was barely mentioned in the hearings or the congressional debate. And even Bunny Sandler, who was quite athletically inclined and became an avid recreational runner around this time, only thought that it might mean, you know, like more field days for girls at annual school, at schools every year. So the early and immediate controversy about women's sports took everybody by surprise. And while athletics continues to be a top enforcement priority, uh, how could it not when female students make up almost 60% of college enrollments, but receive only 44% of athletic participation opportunities. In many ways, Title IX is now much more aligned with its original intent of addressing a broad range of educational issues and concerns on its agenda, and not just a single issue like athletics, which dominated in the 1970s and 80s. Uh, and I always say when I'm talking or, or teaching this topic is that Title IX provides a textbook case of the difficulties and the rewards of putting abstract principles like equal opportunity and gender equity into concrete everyday practice. And it's not easy as we have found ever since. And not surprisingly, implementation of the law got off to a very slow start. Uh, it was passed in 1972, but it wasn't until 1979 um, that the Department of Health, Education and Welfare circulated its first set of guidelines telling schools what standards 
they would have to meet to show they were in compliance with the law. But still, there was quite a lot of progress in the 1970s. In some ways, it's a real breakout period, partly because there's an active women's movement too. Um, but still, the threat of enforcement coupled with the possibility of the loss of federal funds could put pressure on administrators or school official, officials who feared the consequence, consequences of noncompliance. So you didn't have to necessarily find file a complaint. You could just raise the issue. And uh, Donna, Donna Lopiano, who's a, uh, again, someone that some of you may have paths have crossed over the years, is a former athlete who ran the women's athletic program at the University of Texas in the 70s and 80s, put it this way. This is a quote. It was more like a guillotine in the courtyard. People were afraid of it. Uh, and I think that really captures it. And then Bunny Sandler said something in 1981 that really speaks to, uh, I think, the, the way the question was framed. Um, she said that the very existence of Title IX, quote, is a good example of how having a law in place leads to voluntary change. The vast majority of institutions have not made all the changes we would like, but they have made some changes, end of quote. And looking back on her own personal odyssey as the godmother of Title IX, um, Bunny Sandler admits she was naive at the time. And this is one of my favorite quotes that's applicable to so much that's happened to feminism in the last 50 years. Here it is. I believe that if we pass Title IX, it would only take a year or two for all the inequities based on sex to be eliminated. After two years, I upped my estimate to five years, then to 10, then to 25, until I finally realized that we were trying to change very strong patterns of behavior and belief, and that the changes would take more than my lifetime to accomplish, end of quote. So clearly we are in it for the long haul. And I think the way to honor Bunny Sandler's legacy is by continuing to press for true gender equity in all aspects of American life, but especially in education with Title IX as a key tool. And because goodness knows <laughs> there is still so much to be done. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was incredible. The historian perspective is so important, I think, in this arena because it's so easy to almost gloss over all of the daily, very challenging work that had to be done by people like our, like you and the rest of our panelists, but also by Bunny Sandler, who is so beautifully uh, profiled for us. And I think it's inspiring for our students to hear that, right? It's it's insightful, it's inspiring for them. In law school, we give them so much information and sometimes they say, oh my goodness, there's so, there are so many problems, there are so many challenges. But I think seeing how people have really been able to do this in their careers, in their lives, and keep that spark where they say, there's still problems, we're going to wake up in the morning and we're going to keep fighting. It's a wonderful message for us to hear. So thank you for that. Um, I'd like to we have uh, uh, to move on to a second question, if you would be uh, so kind as to to uh, help us address this next point. As we hear from all of you and we think about, yes, the changes that have happened with Title IX, um, but then uh, thinking about this law, I've heard a few of the panelists mention that th there are vague provisions, there are concerns, maybe there there might be some backtrack in years to come. If you could um, see the law changing um, in a direction that you feel might be more productive, what would uh, some of those changes be that you might recommend to our elected officials? And I'll turn first to Dr. Stanley. Wow. So, um... Well, one of the places where I see some change, especially, uh, again, as it relates to um, how we handle sexual misconduct, I think there's significant opportunity in the area of restorative justice and conflict mediation practices. So um, 
not sure that that's something at the at the federal or kind of the legislative level other than providing the the flexibility in our processes to ensure that, that those are options. But I think for especially law students who are thinking about their future, um, if, if this is an area of passion or interest, um, you know, keeping that as a lens, knowing that there should be more options than just a formal hearing where a student, where the outcome is a student might be separated from the university. So where's the, um, where's the true remedy, right? If you just sort of banish someone from from school and then maybe they move on to something else and you're never changing the behaviors or habits. And so I think it's also connected to the first question that you asked. So, um, you know, a focus on restorative justice, conflict mediation, um, and it's not appropriate in every situation, but I'm finding more and more situations it is. And there are some cases where as a Title IX coordinator, I might not have even recommended that in a situation. And I've had student complainants actually want to explore those options with me. And so I think there's a, a lot of opportunity there, especially if the ultimate goal is to remedy behavior and prevent recidivism, um, you know, why not have other options as well, um, you know, to explore that. And then um, additionally, I think one thing that's very interesting in my experience is that I think there's often a misconception about the the role of the Title IX coordinator and the Title IX office, um, I have to be neutral, right? And I think there um, often is a misconception that the Title IX office is a victim's advocacy office. Um, and while, you know, my goal is to provide support for victims, but also for respondents, I have to remain neutral. And so I think it's really important to remember that, um, you know, that that's an essential part of, of the duty. So the duty is to prevent, remedy, and address the prohibited behaviors. Um, I have to be an advocate for the policy. And so remembering that your Title IX policy is a contract with your community members. And so um, it's really important if, um, you know, if you are tapped as an advisor for either party, remembering that um, that's, the, you know, a way that the Title IX process can help either side of the equation, right? And I think sometimes that gets a little bit skewed. So um, for, for those of you on the, you know, as a part of today's um, symposium, if you're thinking about this as an area of interest, you know, just remembering those aspects. Um, and I think the, the question um, that's in, um, in the queue is a good one that, that kind of supports that, right? So that, you know, hopefully there are opportunities for law students to support the Title IX programs in our state and in other states, uh, serving as advisors, serving as uh, support folks, because often, um, and I know the current regulations believe that they're trying to equal the playing field for both complainants and respondents, but in reality, they're, they're, they're skewing the support, where oftentimes um, we find that respondents may have um, different types of resources and and possibly the complainants don't have equity in that process. And so even on the surface, if it seems like, you know, both parties have the opportunity to have the advisor of their choice, participate in the process and support them, that doesn't always mean that, that it's equitable, right? So I think we have to keep an eye to that as well. Thank you, Dr. Stanley. And uh, because you referenced the question in the queue, I just want to read it out loud so that the rest of the participants can uh, hear the question. And then if you'd like to just make another quick response to that uh, before we, we go on, the question asks, is there a way to have more attorney advisors accessible to current students navigating Title IX processes or TRO civil processes. Pro bono legal resources currently available in RI are only available under VOCA, which only covers family court. This leaves a large gap for student survivors, unless they are affluent students, to have equitable access to advisors or legal representation, especially when respondents, defendants do have access to hire their own attorneys. So this was the question in the queue. And, you know, if you'd like, if you'd like to say anything else in response to that, thank you so much. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's a wonderful question and um, really gets to the heart of trying to address um, the inequities that are in the process. So even if 
your policy is written in a way that demonstrates um, an effort for due process and equity, it doesn't in necessarily ensure that. And, um, you know, as referenced in the in intro, um, you know, athletic teams are getting cut because higher education is really trying to manage tight budgets, right? And so what's an area that gets cut sometimes are all of these other um, options for support. And it's um, it's really nobody's fault. It's it's just kind of the nature of trying to keep higher education in business. But um, I think the question is a wonderful one. And if there are ways to develop uh, programs that would uh, give experience to um, to law students and and allow students who are going through these processes to have folks with expertise in this area be their supports. Um, and it's uh, interesting that this question is posed because recently I've been having some discussion with um, Dean Lorraine Lally from the School of Law, who is um, the Title IX deputy for, um, for the law school. And so she and I have started some of those conversations to see if this might be something that could be developed and, and moved forward. And so um, I'm hopeful and optimistic that uh, we can make something like that actually happen, not just for our students here at Roger Williams, but maybe an opportunity that could support students uh, anywhere in Rhode Island. Thank you so much for that. And I also commend the student for putting the question in the queue because um, this is the way that we get change, right? We have to raise it to the level so that people are aware that maybe there may be issues and we want to keep those front and center. So I really appreciate the question. Uh, Susan Ware, I want to come back to you now because you again have this incredible historian's perspective and even the experience that you mentioned, that quote was just amazing thinking Oh, in one to two years, we will solve all of this. You have to love yeah. the optimism, <laughs> right? But now when you see that it does it, it does take so long and yet we want to have a law that is working as well as possible so that it doesn't take, hopefully, another 50 years, right? So that we can start to address this sooner rather than later. What are some of the changes that you might recommend? Well, I... I think I'll I'll speak from what I know best, which is the his the the impact of Title IX on athletics. That's what I've I've mainly studied, and we're at a current moment where a huge challenge is going to be how to fit our increasingly non-binary sense of gender into a sports system which is rigidly segregated by sex. And this issue came up in the 1970s because most of the other aspects of Title IX, when they were talking about you know, getting rid of admissions quotas and things like that, the standard was women would be treated the same equally with men on the same par. They were worried that if they just combined the, the teams, women's teams and men's teams, women would get screwed and that they wouldn't be able to compete. And so they kept somewhat uneasily this system of seg parallel segregation and then talked about, you know, their women's teams and their men's teams, but they should have equivalent resources. Um, but not everybody fits into a women's team or a men's team as we are finding. And two very prominent examples now and, and, they come at it from different ways. One, of course, is uh, Caster Semenya uh, with her new book out, uh, someone who clearly identifies as a woman, uh, but has chromosomal um, abnormalities or whatever the technical term is that make it um, unacceptable to the powers that be, who are mainly men, that she compete as a woman and how unfair she feels that is. And then also the issue of trans women and should they, which team should they be allowed to compete on? And I don't have a clear answer to this. I, it's an incredibly complicated question. I, I, looking back, I can't see any way in the 1970s they would have been prepared to deal with this. But unfortunately, the world of sports has just grown so exponentially in the 50 years that any changes to how it's organized 
and all the money that's involved and, and whatever on campuses and in professional leagues are going to be that much harder to do. But we really are left with a sports system that does not reflect the way we are thinking these days, many of us, about questions of, of sex and gender. And that is a huge challenge. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you so much for that. And, you know, I haven't had an opportunity yet to read uh, the book that came out, Castor's book, um, but I'm really curious to do so. And just in terms of some of the experiences that I, I have read little excerpts of mm -hmm. that she faced as an intersex uh, individual uh, with the norms and still right in 2023, this gender essentialist approach to individuals. And it makes it very difficult for us to know um, how to respond appropriately, how the law should be changed in order to respond appropriately to some of these questions. And we have a, a student question in the queue that is actually <clears throat> related to this topic. It asks, do you think that some sports are unnecessarily divided by sex. So do you think making more sports co-educational would improve funding and decrease inequality for women in sports? So that's the question that the student posed. And I think in line with the conversation that we're having and our uh, evolving understanding of uh, gender, um, could it also address maybe some of the issues that otherwise might, might persist uh, with with that arena as well. Oh, that question makes me so happy. I want to be on that person's team. This is what I've always thought. It drives me crazy that there are things like women's archery and women's bowling and other other sports where there's absolutely no reason other than to segregate what women do as being less important to separate the teams and. Uh, I think the experience of, of men and women, girls and boys playing together is really important. And I really encourage uh, attempts to think about sports in ways that are co-educational, or let's put it another way, just everybody is able to participate. And then we don't have to get caught up in these gender binaries. The tricky thing is certain sports like football. Uh, and there's there's a there's sort of a famous phrase in Title IX history of, you know, when they have all these debates, there's men, there's women, and there's football. Football is just off in its own category. Now, I actually think nobody should be playing football because I think it's dangerous and that there actually could be a way where it could be less harmful to people's bodies and that all kinds of people uh, can play. Is anybody listening to me? No. Um, but I, I do think that for many sports, uh, there are lots of ways that we could really combine the teams, share the scores, and make it so that we could move beyond this, this, this um, segregation by sex. I would also say that we're kind of caught in this trap that I think is going to come up in, in a panel this afternoon, the difference between sex and gender. Title IX uses the word sex. And in the 1970s, it was thought that there were biological differences, I mean, not by everybody, but that that was an organizing concept. And then in the 80s, as women's studies and um, began feminist theory looks at it more, we started talking about more about gender, about, about the construction of social roles. But there was still a sense that there was something pretty foundational about those sex di differences. Well, now we know that isn't the case and that just makes it even more complicated. Um, but it also makes it even more necessary because we can't be disfranchising and leaving people out if we're stuck in these old ways. Absolutely, thank you so much for that. Very insightful. And you know, when you mentioned the football issue, interestingly enough, in one of the classes that I taught this week, this issue came up. We were reading a case about a 13-year-old. Her, her last name was Force. And I told the students that once in a while, we have a case where it's so aptly named. And this was such a case. So it was Force against her school district. And she wanted to play football. Well, she's 13 years old. And the only football team was the eighth grade boys football team. And the school 
initially told her, no, you can't play. We're worried about safety. And of course, then the issue was raised. We're talking about 13 year olds. The size differential, even among the boys, is such that it really doesn't make much sense to say she automatically is excluded. She may be larger, she may be stronger than many of the boys uh, who are allowed to compete for a spot on the team. So the students had a discussion about this, but one student in particular, Amy, I don't know if you're watching, um, she made the exact same point that you made, which was, I'm not sure we should be letting any 13 year old uh, engage <laughs> in this contact sport. And if we're worried about the safety of the girls, why shouldn't we also be worried about the safety of the boys? So there's a sense in, for the students at least, where they see the harms that are flowing to people of all uh, genders, right? Of, of, of any uh, sex, um, when sometimes we do take that gender uh, essentialist approach to what boys should do, girls should do, and so forth. So thank you for that uh, very insightful response. Let me see if we have, um, what I'd like to do at this point is just to make sure that there are no questions among the attendees um, that have not been addressed or that you would like to see addressed. So I'd like to just um, ask those who are in attendance, if you'd like to uh, ask a question of our panelists, to please write it into the Q&A um, on our Zoom, and then I can uh, ask that question. And we also, um, and there's one, one just came in actually. Thank you so much, uh, Angela. So the question is, how do you think the new broader regulations for Title IX expected to come out soon will change how universities respond to complaints of gender identity discrimination or change their practices in any other way. And uh, Dr. Stanley, if you don't mind, I will um, turn it over to you on, on this one, if you'd like to respond. Well, you know, my hope is that um, campuses have um, policies that hopefully won't be too difficult to modify. I think we've gone through the exercise uh, multiple times over the past few years, and I think in preparation for these new regulations, which just sort of seem to get delayed and delayed and delayed, um, you know, hopefully it's it's a matter of um, you know modifying your definitions, um, but the protections should be protecting your students um, in the spirit of Title IX. And so I'm, you know, I'm thoughtful, and as I think about our own policies here, I don't think it's going to be a big stretch. What I think it will do is just um, broaden the scope. Of, um, of how we can protect and support students. And so where the current regulations are very narrow and very specific, um, I think it's just an opportunity to really look at people as um, whole complete individuals and recognize that gender is more than the binary um, and more than our biological sex and um, allow the protections in the spirit of Title IX to you know, to support people um, in, in more broad ways. Um, and again, I think we also have to be thinking about pregnant and parenting students and, um, and you know, the policies as many of our campuses have are actually written um, with sexual misconduct in mind, right? Which may not be appropriate for other types of discrimination. And so thinking about the language of your policy or do you need to have policies that specifically address different things? And so I think it's, um, it's, good to do this annually with your policies to think about, you know, are they still accurate and appropriate to the communities that we support? Um, but whenever there are um, changes coming at the federal level, you know, it, it's it's your mandated time to, to do that. But hopefully schools are, are doing this on a regular basis because the world changes and our students change and policies that were written a decade ago are not going to meet the needs of students who are, are here uh, now. And I do hope that, um, you know, one of the places where I see uh, one of the most significant challenges is the um, cross-examination piece in the live hearings. And again, that uh, I think there are ways to get to credibility and to include cross-examination questioning in your investigation, right? It doesn't, that doesn't have to be a part of a live hearing, which I don't think benefits either party or the witnesses 
creates more stress and anxiety for um, students who already are experiencing a tremendous amount of stress and anxiety just being students, right? So how can we make our processes more reflective of higher education and less um, looking like a court of law? So, um, you know, there there's a time and a place for, for courts of law, but I don't think the higher education model should um, should look like that. So, um, you know, certainly I think the new regulations hopefully will give us opportunity to finesse things that uh, that are in place and provide better support for all of our students. If, if I could add something more about the regulations, and this comes from a historian's perspective, I think we always, we need to remember that Title IX doesn't just exist in a vacuum. It's very much affected by the decade, the political context. And um, Lynette had talked, had mentioned briefly the 1980s when, because of the Grove City decision and because of the Reagan administration, there's basically no enforcement of Title IX at all. And what you see is a pattern because the regulations are coming out of Washington, that they are in some ways, uh, in not always, but they can be influenced by the political the political party in power. And that can be either good or bad, depending on your perspective. But there is a certain amount of moving forward, moving back, moving forward, changing, jousting that is built into this. And I think it just, it adds a little bit of complication, probably especially on the ground, um, because you wonder what what the new regulation is going to say. Um, but again, that is that is built into the process. And I, I think it does even out over the over the long haul. Um, but we can't we can't leave politics out of this because it's very much there. Thank you so much for that perspective. Absolutely. Incredibly important to keep that in mind as well. Uh, the politics piece of all of this. And I also liked your focus on the practical aspects of this and even thinking about somebody in your role, Dr. Stanley, uh, very challenging. You know, I talk to the students quite a bit, you know, at the law school about compliance, compliance as a career and how difficult it is in the arena of education or any other area of law that tends to be politicized in the way that this area is to really be able to provide accurate, timely advice to your clients, right, whoever they may be, but in this case, a university, um, because the laws change uh, so often, right, these regulations change so often. Um, and so this becomes a very challenging part of, of an attorney's work if they do choose to go into this compliance um, area. Um, I wanted to follow up a little bit and, and maybe just change gears just ever so slightly, because as we prepared this panel, one of the uh, questions that the students wanted to know about is more related to your actual work experience, okay? And so they wanted to know first, what aspects of the work that you have been engaged in has been most uh, surprising to you, right? So as, as you've been working, you know, uh, Dr. Ware, from your perspective as a historian, um, as you uncover so much of this information, what has perhaps surprised you? that you didn't necessarily think you were going to uncover? Well, I, I guess I always remain surprised at how few people actually know what Title IX is and, and what it does, realizing, of course, this whole panel has shown there's no simple question, no simple answer to that question. But in a lot of ways, I mean, I'm so used to, I just use Title IX as a shorthand for a whole range of changes that as a feminist, I want to happen in higher education. And yet I find among those who are younger than I am uh, and who, who didn't sort of cut their teeth in second wave feminism in the 1970s, they often either have never heard of Title IX or the other thing that's even scarier for me is that they kind of take it for granted. And you see this especially in the athletic opportunities. And they don't remember what it was like a time when there were not teams for girls. I didn't have 
teams for girls when I was growing up in high school. I turned out to be a really good athlete. I would have loved that, but there was nothing except Girls Athletic Association. And now one of the things that Title IX and other societal changes have done has dramatically increased the opportunities for girls and women to participate in sports. And this is terrific, but they often don't realize how recent that is and how hard fought it was. And also, although they often do have a sense of this, that even though they've got so much more than they used to have, they're nowhere near getting as much as the boys and men's are, men are. And Bunny Sandler, again, had a great quote about that. She said something to the effect of, well, going from zero resources to 20% is, it's good, but it's still nowhere near what it should be. And I find a gap of awareness often on campuses, especially among female athletes, about how hard fought this was and how recent um, and it can go away. Although I, my tendent, my sense is that sports for women have become pretty deeply embedded in colleges and also in public life that we're not going to go back to the girls athletic associations, but we can't not, we can't take our eye off the ball. It's impossible not to use sports metaphors. Believe me. Um, we really have to pay attention because, Nowhere in no school in this country are girls and women getting this equitable resources with men and boys when it comes to sports. Nowhere. Thank you so much. And I think that perspective for us to be able to hear that this morning is so incredible because that's that's why I think for us to be able to be here, and it is an intergenerational type of experience where we have the students who, like you said, are in the situation where they can almost start to become complacent, where you know from what you've read and this history where it could so easily be lost or we could start to um, really see some of these hard fought gains um, unfortunately diminish right in the, in years to come. So I think it is important message for all of us to remain vigilant and to not take any of this for granted. And to also make a case to invite you back for more discussions uh, with us and with our students, because I think that dialogue is so important for them to really hear um, what has taken place before. And why don't I turn it over to Dr. Stanley? I'd like to ask you a very similar question in terms of the work that you've been engaged in, what has surprised you about this work? Even thinking back to maybe when you started the work and then you started to see what your actual day-to-day -day, uh, looked like, tell us a little bit about maybe what surprised you. Yeah, I think one of the things that's um, that continuously surprises me is that um, students, I think, sometimes have a, a perspective that um, engaging with the Title IX office is an all-or-nothing um, choice, right? You know, so you don't have to file a formal complaint to get support. And sometimes the reality is most of the students that I'm working with are seeking some sort of remedy other than a formal complaint. And so, um, you know, I think there's a fear that by reporting or coming forward, you have to connect with the local authorities. And, and sometimes that's the right thing to do. And that's always a choice, but there are so many ways to, um, to, to seek supportive measures that can help remedy and, and move towards equity and prevention of discrimination in the higher ed experience, um, it doesn't have to be you know, an all or nothing choice. And I think that that's one thing that I'm always surprised about when students um, think, well, if I engage with Title IX, I have to have this long investigation, I have to have a hearing, and that's not, that's not the case. Um, it's also surprising to me right now that students actually, Title IX has become a verb. Right. So it's not just a policy. Like sometimes we hear like, oh, I'm going to title nine another student. And it's it's very interesting um, what students actually think title nine is. And again, kind of getting back to the point I made before that title nine is not a victim's advocacy office. There are offices and agencies that do that work um, and do it very well. But title nine needs to be fair, unbiased and support the policy and hopefully in supporting the policy we are making sure that we are providing um, equity and um, you know, an equitable educational environment. But 
um, it, it's very interesting what students know about Title IX. And we worked really hard for many years to help educate students. And then when the new regulations came, it seemed like it walked some things back and it's hard to, you know, to, to relearn some things that are now different or changed. And so um, one of my concerns as a Title IX coordinator is, will the regulations change every time there's a new presidential administration? And how do we ensure related to compliance that our community knows accurate information about, you know, what is current in the moment? Um, and then also trying to do all the advocacy work to make sure that the spirit of Title IX doesn't get lost in, you know, whatever the final regulations are, because um, I would have um, given all of my my money and resources to see Betsy DeVos and her administration actually role play their regulations before they were implemented, because clearly they are created by people that aren't higher ed practitioners, right? You know, and and they might think they know best and they're, you know, hopefully gathering information from a variety of different places. But until you're in it hands on, some of it makes no sense, right? And and why are we creating that environment in higher education where it, it's not reflective of, you know, the work that we do and, and the type of environment that we are. So very interesting. Um, and we'll, we'll see what comes next, right? And I think we we all have to be nimble and go with the flow. But as as law students, I think there's tremendous um, and very interesting future opportunity if this is an area of specialty or interest for you. Thank you so much. And I wanna just um, ask for the, you know, the attendees once again, if anyone has any questions, please do not hesitate to put it into the Q&A. Um, the students also wanted to know a little bit about what has been the most rewarding aspect of this work for each of you. And so uh, Dr. Weir, if I could start with you on this one, as you think of over these decades of work, um, what has been most rewarding? Well, I think this, this goes back to my sense of who I am as a historian and, and as a feminist. And in my work, in my writing and in my public outreach, I really am committed to sharing what I learn as a historian with broader audiences. Because to me, that knowledge, that sharing of knowledge and just getting people involved and excited and learning the history, which is just so important. Um, and Title IX is, and sports are a great way to bring feminism home, especially to young kids. Like you take a group of fifth graders and you say, girls team gets this, boys team gets this, is this fair? They know it's not fair. I mean, they just know. And so sports is a wonderful way of opening up con larger conversations about equity because everybody cares so much about sports. Uh, that, that means a lot to me. It also has been a great uh, honor to be able to meet some of these towering figures in the field like Donna, Donna Lopiano and Billie Jean King uh, and especially Bunny Sandler. And I'm here in my study in New Hampshire and I'm looking up, I should have, I should have taken it down before them, but I have some buttons that she gave me uh, when I interviewed her. She loved to collect buttons, feminist buttons. She had thousands of them. And the two that she gave me were Uppity Women Unite and God Bless You Title IX. So what a pleasure to have, have my path cross hers. Thank you so much. That's wonderful. Uh, you'll have to send me a, a little photo <laughs> of those. I would love to see those. Uh, Dr. Stanley, from your perspective, what has been some of the most uh, re rewarding aspects of, of your work? Yeah, it's, you know, um, usually when people come through my door, it's not for the, for the best circumstances. So um, I have to remember sometimes that it's not always, you know, sometimes it's thankless work, right? But um, there are moments where students will circle back with me and say, thank you so much for the support. You know, the, the different offices you've connected with me with have provided what I've needed to move forward. Um, we do a lot of work with students. We have a student Title IX task force, which is really terrific. And, you know, they have a, a pulse of what's happening on campus. And so I think those um, are the most rewarding opportunities. Um, you know, seeing a student that I meet with and assist as a freshman graduate, right? Like there's nothing more rewarding than that to see that they were able to navigate and be successful 
despite hardships that they might have encountered. And so, um, you know, for, for those who have been doing this work a long time, or even for, for those just starting their career in this area, don't lose sight of the fact that it's important work um, because there will be moments where, you know, my hair gets whiter every day. And sometimes I wonder like, you know, is, is this the right path? And then, you know, do you just have to keep it in perspective and know that um, it's important work? It really does make a difference. And there are, are tremendous opportunities to, um, you know, change the experience of a student to, to make it better, help them find remedy. And then again, in all the prevention, hopefully we can, you know, prevent things from happening before they even do. And, and I think that's, uh, that's where I'm always optimistic that there's a lot of opportunity for culture change, but it takes all of us, right? It, it's, it can't just be one or two people. We all have to do our part to, to make that change. Thank you so much. And that's actually a wonderful segue to what I wanted us to, to close with today, because one of the questions that we often hear from students as professors is, you've given me all of this information. You've, uh, you've sometimes depressed me, right, with the information that you've given me. Now what, right? What do you want me to do with this information? And in conversations that I've had, even in recent weeks with students, we've come to this realization oftentimes, you know, together in my office that maybe we need to take more of a community organizing lens to a lot of the work that we do so that when we provide the information to an audience, whether it's a class or attendees at a conference such as the one that we're at right now, we might be able to then tell them, and now we want you to take this info and do this step, right? Take this next step. So I wonder if you can, putting on to the best you know of your ability, this type of almost grassroots community organizing lens, what would you encourage us all to do um, with this information? And I will, uh, why don't I go to Dr. Ware first? Well, I, I think the most important thing is just to realize we're in it for the long haul. Feminism will always be necessary. Even though there are gains that have been made, there will still be many more things to that need to be done. And then just to look around and find your allies and find the people you care about and just know that it's an important fight. But, you know, remember what Bunny Sandler said, it's not going to be two years, five years, 25. It's going to go on long past your lifetime. Um, but for me, as I get to towards the end of a career, I find that I draw great satisfaction from knowing that I have been part of this larger struggle um, for more than 50 years. And I draw comfort in knowing that it will continue long after me. And who's going to continue it? All the people who are in law school with you and who are watching this webinar. So I say, just go for it. Um, and I'll be with you in spirit. Thank you so much. We really appreciate it in spirit and in person. Okay, because we, <laughs> For a while. we want you. That's right. That's right. Um, and Dr. Stanley, what advice or what suggestions for next steps would you have for all of us? Thank you. Sure. So, I mean, certainly if it's a passion area, explore that. Um, I would say for all of us that we have opportunities in our everyday lives to make change and to be advocates and, you know, from, you know, from the things that you that you engage in as a consumer, you know, what are the businesses that you support? Who are the people that you elect into office? You know, vote, use your your voice in that way to to speak up. But um, you know, we have to we have to kind of embrace our our collective responsibility and not assume somebody else is going to fix it. So there are lots of ways, and I think as we reflect on either the the choices we make and the work that we do, or um, you know, just where we shop and and, um, you know, if you are out in the world and you see something happening, speak up, step in. I mean, there's so many ways, again, with the bystander that it's not just about the experience on a college campus. These are things that that we can engage in in our everyday lives. And maybe the world would be a different, better place if there were more kind, caring people that spoke up and stepped in. But, um, you know, as as attorneys, as, as future attorneys, like you have 
tremendous opportunity to make, you know, some really positive change in the world and um, don't ever minimize the power that you have in doing that, you know, so, and if anybody's ever interested, you know, come on over to my office. I'm, I'm a highly caffeinated individual. I would love to have coffee with you and, or tea and, and chat more about your interests, or if you want to get involved in our student title nine task force. We're always looking for new perspectives, new voices. So please join us. Thank you so much. And the students are incredible. The students that we have here are incredible. I learned so much from my students. They're insightful, they're energetic, and they want to make the world a better place. And so it's important, right, to be able to establish those relationships um, and make sure that we're adequately preparing this next generation so that they can continue this wonderful, incredible work that both of you have been doing for decades. And so I just want to thank you uh, once again, Dr. Ware, Dr. Stanley, for taking the time to be with us today. This has been so inspiring. I really enjoyed listening to both of you. Dr. Stanley, I hope our paths will cross on campus now that I know you. Um, and Dr. Ware, if you are ever in Rhode Island, please do come visit us. We have really, really appreciated uh, being able to spend this time with you. I wanna also thank um, Hillary and the Law Review for putting together this panel and for inviting me to participate. We also want to let everyone know that we will now just take a few minutes uh, of a break and we will resume at 1130 a.m. with our keynote speaker. So I do thank everyone so much for being with us uh, this morning. This has been incredible. It really sets us up, I think, for a wonderful weekend. So thank you so much to both of our panelists. We really appreciate it. Welcome to all of you who are joining us for this, this keynote, and welcome back to those of you who joined us for our excellent panel this morning on Title IX. And if you did miss it, check out YouTube soon because it will go up. My name is Hillary Levy Friedman. I'm a 3L at Roger Williams University School of Law, and I'm the editor of this year's Justice for All edition. Now, this is the second year of the Justice for All edition of the Roger Williams Law Review. And the issue was created to bring light to the need to expand the meaning of all in the phrase justice for all. Now that phrase justice for all, of course, goes back to the founding, but it is clear that many groups of people are left out of that all category. A person's race, sex, sexual orientation, gender identity, religion, citizenship, ability, age, and or socioeconomic stat status are just a few of the factors that can lock them out of receiving equal tr treatment in our criminal justice system or our civil justice system. We recognize how intersections of those identities often compound inequities in the legal system at all levels in all ways. So when we got together, the leadership of the Law Review, to talk about the topic of this year's Justice for All issue, we quickly honed in on changes in gender law, which are constantly shaping all of our lives. We really wanted to focus on the transformation in gender law over the past five plus decades, specifically thinking about how gender identity or expression, sex and sexual orientation intersect with the law and a range of other identities. Now, as we all know, there have been many fights over the past several decades to secure rights. Yet in the past decade, we've seen the slow and steady and at moments calamitous erosion of some of those rights. So what can be done using the law as we're all in law school or many of our lawyers uh, on today? That's what we all want to do. And specifically, we wanted, wanted to think about what we can do in terms of the Constitution. So 100 years ago, in 1923, following passage of the 19th Amendment, women's rights advocates sought to to enshrine the principles of gender equality in the Constitution to help overcome many of the obstacles that kept women as second-class citizens. Over the next 50 years, the fight continued. Until 1972, just a little over 50 years ago, when Congress sent the following text to the states for ratification. Quote, equality of rights under the law shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. The Congress shall have the power to enforce by appropriate legislation the provisions of this article. So after that, things got really interesting in the ERA battle. 
Suffice it to say that the fight to pass the Equal Rights Amendment is ongoing, and that is the focus of today's keynote, in which we are extremely fortunate to hear from one of the true leaders in that fight, the Kia Thomas. Now note that the requisite ratification by 38 states has occurred for the ERA. The last was Virginia in 2020, inspired by a lot of momentum, partially from the Me Too movement and other events of the second half of the 20 teens. But the ERA still is not law. So to guide our conversation on the ERA history, what next steps there are in the fight for equality, and how and why the ERA could help protect everyone's bodily autonomy, our own professor, Emily Sack, will be moderating our keynote today. Professor Sack is a nationally recognized expert on domestic violence and reform of the court system. U.S. Supreme Court Justice Stevens cited Professor Sack's article, The Struggle for the Future of Domestic Violence Policy, in his opinion in the domestic violence case, Castle Rock v. Gonzalez. Active in the community, Professor Sack is uh, very active on elder abuse issues, and she serves as a member of the board and chair of Emerge, a batterer's intervention and parenting skills program for men who abuse intimate partners. Prior to joining Roger Williams University School of Law, Professor Sack worked in diverse offices, such as the Senate Judiciary Committee staff of the late Senator Kennedy, the ACLU, and New York Center for Court Innovation. Here at Roger Williams, Professor Sack is a core part and a centerpiece of our faculty, where she has been an award-winning teacher and professor almost for this entire century. She teaches criminal law, criminal procedure, family law, children in the law, which I'm lucky to currently be a student in, death penalty law, and of course, domestic violence law. So thank you to Professor Stack and Ms. Thomas for being with us today, and I turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Hillary. Somehow I feel very ancient, <laughs> but um, I really want to thank the Law Review for choosing to make this a centerpiece um, and focus their symposium on the, this this year. Um, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to participate. Um, I'm really honored and thrilled to introduce Zakia Thomas. Um, Zakia Thomas is president and CEO of the ERA Coalition and the Fund for Women's Equality. She is an agent for change, and she leads a diverse coalition of over 290 partner organizations representing 80 million people, all fighting for equality. Uh, the coalition advocates for gender, racial, and reproductive justice, LGBTQ plus rights, and much more under the unifying banner of sex equality, and the goal to enshrine the Equal Rights Amendment into the U.S. Constitution. Uh, Zakia is an astute political strategist, an adept campaign manager, and an experienced nonprofit manager. Uh, additionally, she is an adjunct professor at Georgetown Law School, where she teaches a nonpartisan course on how to run for political office and volunteers on several nonprofit boards, ranging from protecting reproductive rights to individual financial empowerment. Um, and thank you so much, Zakia. So uh, what we thought we would do is have a sort of conversation about the ERA and all things related to it. Um, for those of you who in the audience, we'd love to hear your questions. Please put them in the Q&A and we will uh, definitely try to get to all of them. Um, so let me just start out, first of all, welcome and thank you so much, Zakia, for, for taking your time today. Um, start out by asking, um, Hillary just read for us the actual text of the ERA, which is quite short. Um, what you believe um, is so important to get the ERA enshrined into our Constitution um, and why uh, you know your organization is spending um, its energy trying to, to to do just that? Well, thank you so much for having me, Professor Sack. Um, so we at the ERA Coalition are focused on getting the Equal Rights Amendment added to the Constitution because it's simple. I mean, as you see in the text of the language of the bill, um, our we are not in the Constitution right now. If we want to put ourselves in there, we have to do so with an Equal Rights Amendment because it is the foundation upon which all of our laws should be based. If you look at the Dobbs decision as an example, one of the reasons why that case went the direction it could or it did is because there is not a stipulation in the constitution that, that says that you cannot discriminate on the basis of sex. 
So as we try to think about ways in which we can protect against the erosion of our rights that we see going on right now, we really are bringing together this movement of movements of organizations that range from um, gender justice, reproductive rights, um, LGBT plus rights, young advocates. Um, we have folks who've been fighting in this movement for, well, not 100, but 50 years, um, who are all who all understand that if we don't have that foundation of equality guaranteed in our constitution, this rollback of rights that we see will continue to happen because there's no prohibition against it. And that's why we're working so hard to get equal rights amendment added to the constitution. Um, and great, and we're gonna get into some of the, all the, the issues that you just mentioned. Um, but before we get into the whole process of enacting the ERA, let's, let's talk a little more specifically about what the ERA would do or would not do. Um, and there seem to be several different strands of opposition to the ERA. And let me just go through some of them, but, and then I, you know, we can take them kind of one at a time and what your, what your response is to them. Um, you know, some would argue that there are already several pieces of federal legislation that protect gender equality so that the ERA is not needed. Um, others argue that it will uh, lead to, you know, lack of protections for women. Um, I don't know if, uh, I, I'm assuming you've seen that uh, series on Phyllis Schlafly, Mrs. America. But uh, for those in the audience who have not seen it, um, it talks about one of the initial opponents to the ERA. And I, I, I'm old enough to remember that she used to say things like, we'll all have to go to the same bathrooms and we'll, you know, be, uh, um, you know, women will have to fight in, in wars and, you know, things like that. And so she sort of, uh, that, that strand of opposition. Person. Yeah. The world's going to collapse if we have um, gender equality. Yes. Yes. yes, yes, yes. <laughs> um, so so we there's that strand of opposition. Um, and then there's also discussions about how it will interact with other issues, some of which you just mentioned, like abortion rights and transgender rights. So I don't know if you want to take those one at a time and talk about um, why you think those really are not, uh, you know, real, real concerns. So let's start with the first question you asked, which is what will the Equal Rights Amendment do? And so we like to think of the Equal Rights Amendment as a promise of a better future for our country. Really what if, by looking at the text of the amendment, it really gives, Cong it empowers Congress to create laws and re regulations that would protect against sex discrimination. And when you look at the opposition saying, well, then, then we will, that will force us to have um, no distinctions based on sex, which is actually incorrect. What it allowed, what the amendment allows for the, for the courts and for um, legislatures to do is to create protection against discrimination. It's not taking something away, it's adding an extra layer of protection so that we all are covered um, and are not discriminated against because of our, our, our sex. Um, so we like to think of it as that promise of a better future and it enables Congress and the courts to have tools to actually make the change we wanna see in this world to protect against discrimination. And when you look at the bathroom bills, for instance, I, I think it's kind of humorous when you when people say that, oh, if we have an equal rights amendment, that means that you'll have to all use the same bathrooms. Well, people already do use the same bathrooms. We have unisex bathrooms already. And you look at states that have equal rights amendments in their state constitutions, they still have gender specific bathrooms, but they doesn't mean that they have to have uh, gender specific bathrooms. It means that the, you have the option to do whichever you want, as long as it doesn't discriminate. Um, and when you talk about some of the arguments that the opposition is using, there's a lot of fear mongering regarding having predators in bathrooms, for saying that, oh, men are, if we have um, unisex bathrooms, men are gonna go into the bathroom, women's bathrooms dressed up as women and then assault women. If men wanted to assault women, they're not gonna dress up as women to go into the bathroom and do it. They do it already. They do it in our locker rooms, in our schools. They do it in our, they do it every, anywhere they want to because there's no protection against that. The laws that we have on the books, we have a whole patchwork of laws on the books that are supposed to protect against discrimination, but they don't have teeth. Uh, I shouldn't say it that way. They aren't enforceable in some ways. Um, the Violence Against Women Act isn't isn't as strong as it could be because you're not you can't sue in civil court against your accused against the the perpetrator. And so there's really nothing holding people accountable. You can't you can't force a, a municipal um, uh, law enforcement agency to enforce a protective order because you don't have a foundation for that protection in the constitution. So these are some of the things that the Equal Rights Amendment has the potential to to remedy if we put in place laws and regulations that actually do so. So it's a proactive measure that we have to, to do. Once we have the Equal Rights Amendment in the constitution, that's just the first step. 
And if you think about it, it's taken us 100 years to get to the first step of having the Equal Rights Amendment of the Constitution, then the real work of implementation happens. And you see uh, in, in, the, in Section 2 of the amendment that Congress is empowered to take steps to implement the uh, amendment. And that's what we're looking to do. So our work is really focused on first yeah. getting the Equal Rights Amendment into the Constitution, but then making sure once it's there that we have the coalition, the movement, and the people behind it to ensure that we implement the, the uh, amendment to make gender equality a reality in this country. Mm. And just following up, <clears throat> excuse me, following up on that, um, when you say Congress needs to implement it, can you give a sense of the types of laws and things that you're thinking of? Yeah, so we're thinking of laws that would protect it. So we already have laws in the book. So the Violence Against Women Act right now doesn't isn't empowered to do the things it needs to, but Congress could then create laws that supplement and say, okay, these are the remedies that you have. These are the leg legal remedies you have in order to protect against discrimination. When you look at the fair pay, um, the uh, Paycheck Fairness Act is another one where right now, technically, pay fair of uh, fair pay is actually um, supposed to be in our legal system, but it's not enforceable. If you have an equal rights amendment, it's actually enforceable and you can create legislation around that. And that's really what it does. It gives tools and empowers um, the legislator to actually make those kind of changes, both on the state level and on the federal level. Mm -hmm. um, and so turning to the what it does not do or mm -hmm. Uh, some of the concerns that I was talking about before. Um, talk about the interaction with the of the ERA with uh, reproductive rights and transgender rights, because I think people don't necessarily realize that there is an impact in that in those areas too. There is, and for for a long time, um, reproductive rights advocates and ERA advocates were saying, okay, well, the ERA doesn't really have anything to do with abortion because we had. Roe versus Wade in place. So there's 50 years of legal precedent that was protecting against abortion, protecting against um, abortion bans and denying abortion care. Um, but when the Dobbs decision went away, we saw very clearly that the protections we thought we had in place based on the 14th Amendment are not actually there. They're not, we, we can't actually rely on those to create um, the kind of laws and the situations that we need in this country. And so what the Equal Rights Amendment will not do is automatically make everything a fair and evil, equal playing, playing field. We have to do the work to make sure that it gets there. So one of the things that folks talk about on the opposition is if you have an equal rights amendment, that means abortion on demand anywhere, anytime. And while some of us are OK with that, and we think it's perfectly fine. It's not actually the case. What would be the case is then Congress would be empowered to create laws that protect abortion access. States would be able to create laws that protect abortion access. What states would not be able to do is to create laws that deny access to abortion across the country. And the same goes with domestic violence. There are it would strengthen the laws that we currently have on the books because it would give Congress and legislatures the opportunity to create those laws and have them enforceable. And so really that's the distinction. And when we talk about the transgender community in particular, what we see across this country is horrific in my opinion. We're targeting children, we're targeting people because of who they are. And as a black woman in America, I'm very suspect when we create laws that discriminate against people because of who they are. And we should all be concerned because when we start down the, role, the road of eroding rights for certain people, Who's going to prevent them from doing it to us? I mean, the Constitution, we can't forget, was written for and by white landowning men when the rest of us were considered property. I mean, yes, white women were considered property back then for the most part. And so if we want to see ourselves in the Constitution, we have to put ourselves there. And that legal protection from the Constitution only comes if we have an equal rights amendment. And that's why this is so important. It mm -hmm. doesn't take rights away from people. And I think that's really the problem is folks say that, well, if you get more rights, that means I have less rights. And that's not what we're talking about because the Equal Rights Amendment protects men, it protects women, it protects non-binary people, it protects trans people, it protects everyone because it, what it says is you cannot deny someone something based on their sex. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, and, and just to get into some of the legalities of this, and I know you are not an attorney, as, uh, <laughs> but you seem very comfortable with these issues. Um, my understanding, at least one of the arguments is that the from a legal perspective is that the ERA will raise um, sex, gender to a suspect classification. Mm -hmm. And as we know, currently, uh, the Supreme Court does not treat uh, gender discrimination under that highest strict scrutiny type of um, standard. And so uh, I, I think it would be helpful if, if you feel comfortable talking a little bit about how that would make a difference in some of the things you've just talked about, like abortion rights, you know, what would the Dobb decision have looked like or, you know, potentially yes. uh, if the 
the ERA had existed. So if we had that higher level of scrutiny, then you couldn't, then the, the state governments and federal governments and across the board would have to have a much higher case for discriminating against, against someone based on sex. Right now, because you don't have that higher level of scrutiny, the state can do whatever they want as long as they have a justification for it. But you need a much strong, stronger and more compelling reason to discriminate if you're at, a, at the level of strict scrutiny. And I know there's some cases going across the country right now um, involving strict scrutiny that actually are trying to put strict scrutiny on, on its head. And Julie Suk, actually, she's one of our advisory council members. She's, um, I believe, at the Columbia Law School. She's do, wrote a, written a couple of books about this, about how having that level of protection, th the benefits of it, but also how it's trying to be torn apart and eroded right now and used against its original purpose. So there are folks out there who are doing that research and looking at the, the depth of it. But the, the bottom line is that if we had that higher level of scrutiny, then the state governments, local governments, federal government would have to be more cautious, intentional, and purposeful in the in the legislation that they put forward, or else it would be struck down by the under the Constitution. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I think that when uh, we saw, obviously, from the Dobbs decision that facing some of these really critical rights on the right to privacy, um, we know is, at least under the Supreme Court, on very fragile territory. And so, uh, I, there even back with Roe v. Wade, there were people who said it should have been based on the Equal Protection Clause. Yeah. But obviously, there are problems with the Equal Protection Clause as involved gender. And so it seems as though the ERA would make such a huge difference um, that couldn't be kind of manipulated in the way that the right to privacy has been manipulated by the court. Yeah. So Antonin Scalia even said that, you know, the Constitution doesn't doesn't um, uh, demand that you discriminate on the basis of sex, but it doesn't prohibit it. And so, I mean, the justices have even have even said, and there's case law to, to document that if we want to have protection against sex discrimination, we have to make it happen on our own. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so let's turn a little bit to the the actual process of uh uh, enacting and ratifying the ERA. Um, actually, let's start first because Hillary mentioned, you know, this started in 1923, and um, I'm not asking you to <laughs> go into every play by play since then, but, you know, could you give a sense of how the ratification process started and kind of where it is right now? And so I would love to give you a play by play of the last hundred years of the women's um, and feminist movement and women's gender equality. But so uh, we're actually celebrating the hundredth year anniversary of the introduction of the Equal Rights Amendment. Um, we on uh, it's actually December 13th is when the ERA was first introduced in Congress. And so we're actually going to do a celebration around that day because that's that's momentous for us. Um, but then 50 years after that, um, 1972, um, we had the um, then Congress passed the Equal Rights Amendment with strong bipartisan support. Remember, both the Republican Party and the Democratic Party had the Equal Rights Amendment on their platforms during those presidential elections in the 70s, in the early late 60s, early 70s. So there was strong consensus across the country that this is something that we wanted. Um, and when you mentioned Phyllis Schlafly, it's there's a cult of personality around her that's just been it's just been inflated. So she was actually the front for a lot of business interests, but they knew that if you had a, you know, a white businessman saying, oh, women, you can't have your rights, that's not going to look right. But if you have a housewife who's saying that it's better for the country, it's better for women if we don't have the Equal Rights Amendment because it would take away rights from, from folks, that's a lie. Um, and the lies that they also perpetrated were that you know, uh, marriage equality would become legal. Women would have to fight in, in combat zones. Um, bathrooms wasn't a thing then, but you get the sense of where I'm going with this. So what we've seen is all the things that they said would would come tearing down on this country and would be the ruin of us. I mean, gay marriage is celebrated across this country and across the world because it's it's a beautiful thing to see people being able to, to be who they are and show their love for one another. Women in combat means that they're able to increase their they're able to increase their job prospects because they're able to, to move up the ladder higher and become higher ranking officers and get better pay because they're able to do that. It's not saying you have to do it, but it's saying you have the opportunity to. And that's the other part about it too. When you look at the abortion question, we're not saying you have to go out and get an abortion. You have to get one on demand. It's saying you have the option to do it. Don't like abortions, don't have one. I have a, a cool t-shirt or sweatshirt that says that big smiley face that says, don't like abortion, don't have one. And it's true because we don't all agree on what on, on abortion, but most of us agree that 
we should be in charge of our bodies and having someone else tell us that, that we don't have that capacity is not something we want as a country that we consider the home of the free um, or home of the brave, uh, land of the free, home of the brave. Um, so when we, uh, so I'm getting off track here, but going back to the amendment itself. So in, in 1972, it was passed by both houses of Congress with strong bipartisan support. Over the next few years, we got up to 35 states ratifying. And then we had this, um, then we had this pushback by these corporate interests because do you have to pay women more under the under if you have an equal rights amendment you probably have to pay women uh, equal pay for equal work you can't discriminate against them in health insurance you can't have charge them more for health insurance but give them less coverage or say you're charging them for things such as th they say because women can become pregnant it's okay to charge them higher rates but then they don't cover pregnancy as part of the plan and so it's an additional cost anyway so it's really not truth in advertising. Um, and if you have to, pro if you actually have to stand up to protective orders and all the other things that actually cost money to implement, then people realize that it's an economic interest, but they're using social issues as the front because they know that people get charged up about social issues. But if you actually tell them why you're doing the thing, they're going to realize it's not, it's an economic interest and it's someone's economic interest and not ours because women who are able to control their bodies, who are, have better pay, it's better for the country. And frankly, paternal leave, fam paid family leave is better for the entire family. Um, and we've seen studies that show that other countries have, have done the same thing. So fast forward to 20, um, to the last decade. So we then had, so there was an arbitrary time limit that was added to the Equal Rights Amendment as the third clause or the third section. Um, I'm sorry, actually it's in the, in the, in the timeline, um, in the, the preamble, there's a, there's a clause that says that, um, there's a, a timeline on when the Equal Rights Amendment could be added or uh, ratified. But then Congress then moved the timeline again um, in, a, in a subsequent session of Congress. It's noted it's a subsequent session of Congress, not the same session. And so our argument is that because Congress has moved the deadline, has been able to add this arbitrary timeline, has moved the timeline once, Congress has the authority to remove a timeline. And so that's the work that we're doing right now. Now that we have the amendment ratified by the request, the requisite 38 states. It should be in the Constitution, and it wasn't put in the Constitution because the archivists at the time sought legal counsel from the Trump judicial um, uh, department of the uh, Judiciary Department, and they said, okay, well, because the timeline has passed, then it's null and void, so it, you can't put it in the Constitution. We have a new administration. The legal memo that was put forth is still, it's still holding. Um, our president thinks and knows that he as the president doesn't have the authority to move the, to to put a constitutional amendment into the constitution. Um, the archivist, it's a, it's a ministerial duty and that, that's what the archivist job is, but he wants Congress to act so that we have um, Congress taking away that timeline and making it official that yes, affirming that this is the, the bill, is, that the amendment is part of the constitution and it should be recognized as such. So that's really the work that we're we're doing right now. We currently have two bills in the House and the Senate, um, co-sponsored. Co um, that the first bill affirms that the Equal Rights Amendment has been ratified and it's met all the criteria to be added to the Constitution, and that the um, and that the timeline is notwithstanding. The other bill uh, also affirms that the Equal Rights Amendment is uh, has been met all the requirements, and that it calls on the archivists to publish the Equal Rights Amendment. So. We are actually further along and closer than we've ever been in history to having the Equal Rights Amendment in the Constitution. We had our first vote in the Senate last year, um, and we had majority support in the Senate, but we could not get past the filibuster. We're still working on that. Um, minor, uh, majority Leader Schumer had used a procedural move to make it so that we can bring the vote up again before the session is over. So we're hoping that we can get that back in front of folks um, after, before the 2024 election. Um, and in the House, we've also are working on a discharge petition to get uh, Congresswoman Ayanna Presley's bill to the floor to bypass committee, because we also have strong um, bipartisan support there as well. So we are closer than we've ever been. It's been 100 years. We just need to get this thing in the Constitution. Then we can actually start the real work of making sure that we have gender equality across the country. So let me just, uh, you said really important and I just want to make sure everyone understands some of these steps. So just just to talk a little bit about the role of the archivist, which you know sounds kind of arcane, but is, is actually quite important in this situation. Um, so the archivist is a presidential appointment, as I understand it, confirmed yes. by the Senate. 
um, but it is sort of a congressionally uh, created position, I, I guess. And it's in uh, actually um, uh, the, the process, they are supposed to, as you said, perform kind of a ministerial function of ratifying or sorry, uh, certifying, certifying, sorry, the ratifications of the states of the ERA. And then when the requisite number is reached, which is 38, to quote, publish it in the constitution. Um, I, my understanding, first of all, is that there's a controversy over whether that's actually even necessary for this to be a valid amendment. Um, if you look at article five of the constitution that talks about how to uh, create amendments, it says, you know, when you get the requisite number, uh, the amendment will be valid or some, something to that effect. I'm here. I'm, I'm no, you're right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so can you just talk a little bit about is the archivist in the prior administration uh, you said was kind of resistant? What, you know, what is their reasoning for why they aren't just performing this mysterial uh, task? Because they, well, first of all, everything in our country is political. Let's just start with that. Um, so from a few, so the, the current, um, the current archivist was actually confirmed this year. Um, and she, uh, Colleen Shogun, and she has said that it's not her, it's not her responsibility, um, that Congress actually needs to, um, that Congress actually needs to confirm that the Equal Rights Amendment is part of the constitution. If you ask a lot of folks in our coalition, myself included, it is the law of the land. We just need to execute it. Um, but until it's published officially, most folks won't won't agree with that. But to, to your earlier point, they don't actually need to do anything. It's met all the criteria, and so it should be recognized as law. We're taking the extra steps to make sure it is recognized as law. And that's why we're working with Congress to go through the steps. To be honest, like each branch of the government is pointing at each other to say, it's your job, it's your job, it's your job. But again, that's DC. That's the political environment in which we work. Um, but we understand that. And so we're working all the avenues. We're working with the president and his office uh, to to do what we need to there to build support and to to let them know that, you know, we're polling at 80 percent in the in the polls right now for the Equal Rights Amendment. I don't know any politician who's polling that high or any issue uh, except abortion. If you pair abortion and um, and the Equal Rights Amendment together, the numbers are ridiculously high across the country. Um, and we're working with the Senate, we're working with the House, um, and we there, we, were, we were going through, there was a law, uh, a case that the three attorneys general from the last three states brought forth um, uh, saying that the Equal Rights Amendment should be published, should be added to the Constitution because their rights as states, because they, they proceeded with the ratification, they then it should be published because they took the steps that needed to be and their, then their rights were not taken into consideration when the archivist said that we're not going to publish the, the amendment. And so we're going at this from all different levels because each level is pointing at the other to say, it's your job, it's your job. But we know that it's there. We just need folks to come to the table and say, we agree, it's there, go do the thing. Because one of the concerns is if we don't have the Congress weigh in, some of the concern is it's going to go to this, someone's going to bring a case and take it to the Supreme Court. And with the Supreme Court, we're pretty sure how it's going to turn out if unless Congress can say, no, no, no. We can. We took the we took the deadline away. We we affirm that it's that it's legit and that it's it should be the law of the land. And with having that seal, because the judiciary has already said it's Congress should be able to act in that the AG's case. They said Congress has the ability to act. The president has said Congress has the ability to act. Congress is showing that they there is bipartisan support, majority bipartisan support in both houses. We just need to get through the procedural issues that we find in the House and the Senate to get the Equal Rights Amendment to the floor. Um, the, the new legislation to the floor for a vote to make sure that the Equal Rights Amendment is affirmed and published in the Constitution. We shouldn't have to take that step, but we're doing that anyway, just to make sure that it we're taking all avenues to make sure it, it happens. So is, is the archivist's position that she needs some type of directive from Congress in order to publish it? And, and is that still true under this current archivist from the Biden administration? Yeah, so if you look at her, uh, the confirmation hearing uh, earlier this year, so she was asked the question whether or not she believes the archivist has the power to certify amendments uh, when there's a dispute as to how many states have ratified. Um, and her understanding is the function for the archivist is that 
um, has been described as a ministerial one. So they published an amendment as a, as a part of the constitution. They're not the one who decides whether it's part of the constitution. So she kind of answered, didn't answer the question. Um, but the understanding is that um, she feels as though Congress needs to, Congress should act to take away the timeline and to affirm the, the equal rights yes. amendment. And once she does, once they do that, then she has the ability to, um, to proceed and publish the equal rights amendment. Right. And, you know, as you were saying, every branch is pointing at each other. So it may be sort of surprising that President Biden isn't taking more of an active role in pushing this forward. Um, I understand that he doesn't necessarily have the, you know, the actual authority to do it, but doesn't he have a lot of uh, influence, obviously, both in Congress, but also like in his executive branch memo, like the one that was written during the Trump administration that told the archivist not to do it. it, it couldn't he, uh, you know, have his legal office of legal counsel do the same thing, uh, you know, saying that they have to do it? <laughs> yeah. So um, <laughs> the joke around our camps is that, you know, this president actually believes in the Constitution and wants to uphold it. And so he doesn't see that that's his role. So he is using the, the bully pulpit to push forward the amendment, but to actually take the step to force the, the archivist to, to publish, he doesn't see that as his role. Um, previous administrations did see that as their role, but here we are. Um, so he has been, so we we know that the Equal Rights Amendment is very high, um, has very popular support in the administration. We, we work with them on a regular basis. It was talked about in the presidential debates in, in 2020. We need to show the folks in power that the people whose voices are not being heard need to be heard or else they're going to get out of office. When the previous um, panel was talking about voting, like that is the biggest thing. Unfortunately, most don't, most politicians listen to their donors and not the people who put them in office. So if we want things to change, we have to put people in office who actually do the things we want rather than vote against our own interests because it's in their interest, their financial interests to maintain the status quo. Um, so yes, there is support in, in the White House. They are actually the, the White House is has, has is working with Congress. The Congress is working with the White House to build support. We just need more people to realize, more elected officials in Congress to realize that people want this. They don't believe the, the hype that's been put out against it. And it needs to be put into the Constitution because our literally some people's lives are actually at stake right now. If you look at some of the legislation that's being put forth, women are dying. Trans kids are under threat. They're, they may be committing suicide. They may be bullied and attacked. This is not a good situation for our country. And if we had an equal rights amendment, that would allow another layer of protection and discouragement against this kind of, these kind of attacks that we see in our country right now. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you were talking, which I, I, another surprising thing that you said um, was that there really is bipartisan support in um, in the Congress. Um, and is, I want to first make sure that that was true in the House as well. And um, what what's holding it up exactly? I mean, maybe you could explain for those of us who are not D.C. insiders to understand that. It's partisan politics. If the leadership in the House, when we see the leadership in the House and the Senate, regardless of which party it is, say, OK, it's OK for you to vote how you want to on this bill. We see a lot more support for our issue. Right. Because people feel empowered and that they're not going to get blowback and pushed back again by their own party. How long did it take us to get a speaker of the House? Right. That's indicative of the kind of issues we're facing. We have infighting in, amongst the party that's in control um, of our of our legislature. And that is really to our own detriment because we have one or two people who are holding up the entire country from moving forward. And that's a travesty. And so we just need to remember that when we go to the polls this year, next year, and every year after that. Mm -hmm. And are, is the opposition sort of like you were saying, you know, initially about some of these social sort of cultural war issues are kind of a front for other more economic issues. Um, is that, do you think still the case today? Oh, very much so. So we've actually done research to see, to figure out who we should be targeting in the House in particular um, and regarding like what districts we think are most likely to either flip or to have their member vote our way because they see their people want us to. When you look at how much money some of these members of Congress are getting from the interests that are opposed to equality and to the Equal Rights Amendment in particular, there's no way they're going to vote against it. And it's not because their people want, don't want them to. It's because they have so much financial interest 
they're, they've been bought. And so it, it's, it's ridiculous. We have a few interns who spent the summer doing this project and they were, they got so excited about it because when you see the money trail, it's clear why people have the positions they have. And they use the social issues as a cover and a front. And we have to expose that because literally people's lives are at stake and our future and our prosperity as a country is at stake. Mm -hmm. And are those interests, are they business interests or are they- Business interests. Universities also have an interest in not enforcing Title IX. Um, There are, you lose money if you you report how many rapes actually happen on campus, you can lose, you lose donors. Um, Mm -hmm. And you have students who don't want to come to your school you have upset parents, you have insurance agencies, you have health insurance. It's it, the same sort of actors who have a financial interest in the past still have a financial interest currently. There are there are religious institutions who have interest in this also. Look at so where money is coming from and who it's going to and who has who benefits the most from the status quo that we have financially. And that's where you're going to find the folks who are backed by those interests are the ones who are adamant that we shouldn't proceed. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, so I think that, you know, you've, you've already started talking about voting, et cetera, but, um, our, you know, we have an audience here with a lot of law students who are very interested in this issue. And I just wondered if you could give, um, some ideas and specifics about what kinds of things they might, uh, be able to do to actually move this forward, if that's something they're, they're passionate about. So as I said, we are movement of movements. So there are organizations across this country who are working to push equality forward and who are working to get get out the vote, but working to do a myriad of of, uh, work to move us forward. Participate in them. Join those movements. Find something that you're passionate about and and bring more awareness to this this situation. Go on social media and talk about the Equal Rights Amendment. Have conversations when you're at home at Thanksgiving to say, did you know we don't have an Equal Rights Amendment? 80% 80% of the country thinks we have one. They don't realize that we don't. Um, and so having conversations is actually important. One of the things I, I charge people with is have a conversation with someone without trying to change their mind. Just have a conversation. Be open to it. Don't defend your position. Don't push your position on them. Just have a conversation because we've lost that art and that way of communing, which is why we're so divided. It's easy to put people in a bucket and say, oh, well, you believe this. We're, we are a nonpartisan organization, but we are political. We do understand the, the importance of political power and leveraging it, but we need to bring more people to the table and not make assumptions based on how they think, because they may not have, have understand how this issue might impact them or someone else because it's never been brought to their attention. So mm-hmm. we try not to make assumptions about that. Yeah. Voting is, of course, the biggest thing you can do. And I know a lot of us feel as though our vote doesn't count, but more and more these days, voting decisions are being made by like, hundred votes out of thousands of votes, or maybe a thousand votes out of a million votes. It does make a difference. And if you don't vote, you're actually giving the other, you're giving whatever side you don't like an opportunity because you're not weighing in on it and you're letting someone else take your vote away from you. Mm -hmm. Um, And if you want to be practical, if you are an activist, call your member of Congress, tell them what you, they, they listen to their constituents more so than they listen to someone outside of it. They listen to money first, let's be honest. And then they listen to their constituents. Not all of them. I shouldn't, I shouldn't be so pejorative. There are a lot of good people in elective office, but there are a lot of bad people too, and people who don't have our interests at heart. And so we need to be judicious in the people we send into those positions. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, to wrap, to, to summarize, vote. Mm-hmm. Talk to your member of Congress. Um, uh, talk up the Equal Rights Amendment and join an organization. But if, if you can't do those things, if it seems like it's too hard, join the conversation online, right? Just have a, and, and talk to people, raise awareness about the things you care about. And hell, at some point, I, I yeah. teach a class on how to run for, for office, run for office, yeah. run for local office. All my students always want to run for Congress. I'm like, yeah, you can run for Congress, but you can make a lot more impact in your community if you're running for the, for the local offices, for your state Senate, for your state house, um, for your municipality. That's where real change is made because those are the communities that then you can make more impact and then expand mm-hmm. that on the larger scale. Mm-hmm. Um, I just wanted to circle back to uh, a couple things you raised. Um, one, I think sometimes people who live in a, a liberal state uh, that might have something in their state constitution that is ERA like um, say, well, why should I care about having a federal ERA? What is the 
purpose, let's say every state, ha I mean, this is unlikely, but let's just say every state had passed its own version of the ERA. What um, What's the point of having a federal law, uh, federal constitution amendment, excuse me? Because we need the stronger protection at the federal level. Mm -hmm. Many times the federal, federal um, law does trump state law. And so you you want to make sure that you have protection at every level that you have. If nothing else, having just making sure that you have that positive protection, I think is important. If nothing else, fundamentally, we are one of very few de uh, develop uh, democracies. Actually, I don't know if any democracy that doesn't have an equal rights that was written in the modern era that has a constitution written in the modern area that doesn't have a, an equal rights amendment in, in its constitution. I mean, think mm -hmm. about that. All the, we ask the world to, we think the world looks up to us, but in that one way in particular, we are the outlier and not in a positive. Way. We need to make sure that we are upholding and, and standing to the values that we purport that we have as a nation. And this is a fundamental one. Equality is a fundamental value for our country. And we need to make sure that we're not only saying that, but we're actually living that. And that's mm -hmm. really one of the reasons we need to have it. If nothing else, if not for the legal protection it affords. On the on, across the board, we need it because it is it is a symbol of who we want to be as a country and who we say we are, and we're actually putting it into practice. Mm -hmm. Um, in this morning, uh, in the first panel, uh, one of the attorneys who has done a lot of civil rights work pointed out that Rhode Island um has kind of a version of the ERA in its constitution, but she said that the Rhode Island Supreme Court several years ago had actually um, uh, issued a decision where they said that that did not provide for any individual enforceable rights so that a private person could not bring an action. So mm -hmm. I think that's a very good example of what you're talking about, that you know we may think we have protections that don't actually exist um, to the extent that they would under a federal equal rights amendment. Um, yeah. Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, and actually, the majority of the states actually do have state equal state uh, equal rights amendments in their state. Even some states that didn't ratify the federal ERA have had equal rights amendments or something similar in their state constitutions. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so I have a couple more questions for you, but I also want to just invite the audience to put some questions into the Q and A so we can uh, answer those. Um, Zakia can answer those. Um, but as I'm doing that, uh, let me also just circle back to the Supreme Court for a minute, uh, because you mentioned that they would get involved only if uh, there was a challenge once the archivist published the, uh, you know, published the, the amendment. But and you said, well, if Congress authorized it, you know, if these bills passed that you talked about, um, we, you know, the ERA would be on much firmer ground. And I, I guess my question for you is, given this Supreme Court, do you think that even with that type of congressional support, there would be any concern that they would somehow uh, rule that, you know, the deadline had passed, et cetera, et cetera, um, and therefore uh, it was not a valid amendment? Well, what this, this court has demonstrated is that they don't hold they don't hold precedent and they don't hold the rule of law the same way previous courts may have. Like there, there have been some dis questionable decisions that have been made in my opinion in this, by this court that give me pause to think that it's a, it's a no brainer. I think I would love to say that any court that actually sees if any court that actually looks at the history of the, the amendment precedent of other amendments before it um, would say that, okay, it's met all the requirements it's done. Congress has done its job. The people have spoken. It needs to be in there. But we've seen this court has been very activist. They are very activist judges on that court. And they also believe that it's their job to help shape the policy rather than just make judicial decisions or ju ju decisions based on the merit and the facts in front of them. So I don't have much faith, but I have to keep working on that. And my that's not true. I do have faith. I have faith that they will realize the importance of this moment. And even those who abortion was their thing and they 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 knew they were going in there to turn to, to, to take down Roe and they did their job. Um, but they see the merit of this bill, of this amendment, and they understand that this is what the, the country needs and that they 
they should do the right thing. We want everyone to do the right thing. This isn't just for me. It's not just for you. It's for everyone in this country and for generations to come. And it will impact them. Um, and I'm hopeful that they will they'll make the right decision. Is it likely? I don't know, but I'm hopeful that they will. Mm -hmm. um, and just to speak about, you know, your own background with this, um, how did this become a passion for you? Because I think for, for law students here, and by the way, I think you should become a professor of law. I guess you are an adjunct professor of law, but you seem like you are very comfortable discussing legal issues. Um, how did this become your passion? Um, and I, I think it's really important for students to see career paths that they might want to take. Yeah, so my career path has been, I like to say I find myself where I need to be when I need to be there. And this position is no different. Um, so I was actually the executive director of the National Women's Party, which you may know of. Uh, it was mm. actually it, they were part of the suffragette movement to bring the um, uh, the 19th Amendment to fruition and actually helped write the founders helped write the Equal Rights Amendment. Um, and so I've always known as a black woman in America that my rights are tenuous. Like when you talk about abortion access and you look back on forced pregnancy, I mean, that's how my people came to be in this country, like rape, sexual assault, domination, force, all the things, right? And so I have a deeper understanding of what it means to be able to say that I have protection. I don't really feel as though the country is designed to protect me, not my interests, definitely. And so I have a vested interest in making sure we have an equal rights amendment. I mean, as a Black person, my civil rights have been under someone else's thumb my entire life and for generations before me. And so I want to make sure that we're doing everything we can, having all the tools that we need to make sure that this country is actually living up to the promise that we all strive for when we when we learn when we're young, because it hasn't. And we need to make doing the put in the hard work, do the things we need to and use our skills and talents the way the way we can. So uh, so I my career started off in took a few turns. I went to, I actually have a master's of social work and I studied social welfare policy because I knew that the systems were messed up and I wanted to understand how they're messed up and how I can fix them. And so, and so I went into, from there, I went into politics. So I managed political campaigns and I only worked with women, pe uh, people of color, women and people of color. So men and women of color, but also white women as well, because I knew that we have a much harder time getting funding and having people who actually understand our challenges and trying to run for office. And so I use my skills and talents there. And that's how I, what I bring to this as, um, as the uh, president and CEO of the ERA coalition. I bring all of my lived experiences to the table to actually make this happen because I have skills, talents, and a vision for what I want this country to be like. And it's up to me to make sure that I contribute in the ways that I can to make that happen. Wow. That's very it's very inspiring, really, Zakia. Um, sorry, just back to a, a more technical question, which has to do with the ratification and the timeline. Um, again, for people who may not be as familiar with it, um, why did Congress originally put a timeline on the ratification? And was that done for other amendments? Or can you give a sense of that? Yes. So, um, so two things. So a timeline, a timeline has been put on other bills, but the difference being the timeline for the Equal Rights Amendment was that it's the preamble and not to the text of the amendment itself. So there is a distinction. I mean, if you talk to anyone who studies uh, st who studies uh, statutory law and understands that, like the preamble is one thing, but it does what you're really voting on, what the really the, the meat of the um, bill is, is the the text of the bill. Um, there have been other bills that have had a timeline, um, but in this case in particular, the reason why the timeline was added was because it was added as basically the death knell, because the, 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 the member of Congress who added that language knew that if that there was going to be this big push against it and it would and it would never get 38 states. Well, look, we got 38 states. And if you can add a timeline to the bill, if you can extend the timeline to the bill, then you can remove the timeline to the bill and that or to the amendment. And that's where we are right now. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, we have a question, which is uh, who else do you think would be influential to get on board um, to help see this across, get, get across the finish line? Um, are there specific groups that you're working with or specific, you know, political figures or other figures? 
what, what do you, who, who's missing in the coalition, I guess, um, would be interesting. So it's not, so there's two parts to that question. One is we need more people, frankly. Like we need everyone who's listening to this webinar, watching this webinar, everyone at the law school, everyone that I'm, I'm about to have a, we're about to do a convening here. Everyone who doesn't know what's going on to be invested and engaged because that's actually how it's going to happen. The political will is what's gonna get it over the finish line. That's why it's taken so long. It's because not enough people have invested in people think that we have things that we don't have rights that we don't. Um, but if you talk about political figures, I mean, the president is engaged, but I said, again, you need political will. You need people calling their members of Congress and saying, this is important to me. We need people who understand that, who believe in abortion access to call their member of Congress. They, they need to talk to the people that care about this issue also for them. And I should say, we are not an abortion rights group, but right now that is a very hot topic in our world. And that is one that is very t closely, could very well be tied to e the Equal Rights Amendment. So I just want to want to put that out there. Um, and we have reproductive rights and justice organizations represented in our coalition. Um, but we... We really, it really is, you can have all of the big names in the, in the country pushing for this, but until you have the political will to get it done, it's not going to happen. And that's why we need more people invested in this because the people who can make the decisions are making them, but they have other priorities unless we make this one for them. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so another couple of questions. Um, one is, can you talk a little bit about the ratification process, um, particularly the the states that recently um, ratified the amendment, um, how uh, how was that actually done politically? Um, mm -hmm. Again, based on my knowledge from the Mrs. America series, it seemed like Schlafly and you know all the opponents at the time with the original ratifications was very, uh, you know, was really working the states, uh, et cetera. And I assume that this was happening on the other side as well. And maybe you could talk a little bit about how you got those more recent states to uh, move forward with this. Yes, yeah, so uh, it is a state effort. And so Pat Spearman in Nevada was actually the spear spearhead. She led the effort in Nevada for the ratification in that state. Um, and there are actually a number of states in, in so what happened is that's, in her state, the ratification had to go through the legislature. So different states have different ratification processes. Um, but in Virginia, Illinois, and in, in Nevada, the, the process is it has to be introduced in the legislature and it has to be ratified through the legislature. So she got, she started this campaign with um, a number of other members of the, of the um, Arizona uh, State House to push forward this the amendment to get it ratified. So that was, you know, it's called the three-state solution. So we knew we needed three states. And so we started... We, the coalition, others outside of the coalition, but all of us under this umbrella of pushing forward equality, started this process of building support for the Equal Rights Amendment on the state level to get the final three states needed to ratify the amendment. I'm from Virginia, so I'm very proud that we were the last, we are the final state needed, but there are still other states currently that are working for working towards ratification efforts. Um, and so it's, it's brilliant to see because we know that if we have support on the on the state level and the local level, that builds up to the national level as well. And so there are continuing efforts to ratify the Equal Rights Amendment in states that have not yet done so. But it is really a state effort. It's getting it on, getting the um, either a ballot initiative or if it's a, um, a referendum or if to have the legislature actually ratify, vote to ratify directly. Mm -hmm. And in terms of moving it forward in Congress with the, the bills that you've talked about, um, are the people who are, you know, you mentioned from states that have ratified <clears throat> the amendment, are they putting pressure on their Congress people to, you know, to to pass this bill or these bills that you talked about? We do. And so as part of the coalition, we are all over the, the nation. So we have people, we do congressional a uh, actions all the time. We have campaigns going all the time. Call your member of Congress, tell them that you want the Equal Rights Amendment. We do tweet storms. We flood them with messages. We flood them with phone calls. Um, but you do have folks um, who are opposed to equality that have, I mean, they're the people who are in those states who want to see this happen are disheartened in a lot of ways because they see all the issues that they care about being completely ignored or fought against by their member of Congress. And so mm -hmm. that's what it goes back to. If they're not representing you, vote them out. And mm -hmm. a lot of us are being represented by people who do not have our interest at heart, whether it's this issue, it's health care, mental health gun violence, all of the things. Um, and so we just need to be more mindful of the people we put in office. Mm -hmm. 
And I think a question um, is in the Q&A that, that a lot of people have, which is, <clears throat> would the ERA negatively impact any existing benefits or protections for women? Um, are there, you know, things like uh, child support or social security benefits or you know, things like that? And this actually goes to one of the questions that's in the, the, the Q&A. So the Equal Rights Amendment, actually, it doesn't mean you there are no distinctions based on sex, but what it does say is you can't discriminate. So if, if we remember, Ruth Bader Ginsburg actually used one of the first discrimination cases she brought was a man who was who I think he was being you probably know this better than I do. He was being discriminated against because he wanted to take time off to take care of for his parents. But because he was a man, they didn't want him. They, there was no people don't think that was OK, because he's why would you take off time to, to care for your parents? It's not a thing. So we do see that some of the earlier discrimination cases were actually men because we know that the 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 the, the judges in, in those cases, the justices in those cases would have more, more understanding if it was a man being discriminated against than a woman. And so that's why she was very strategic in bringing those cases to forward. So if you think of it this way, it doesn't mean that you can't have that there isn't child support, it's spousal support or, or not spousal support. It's child support is based on who is a primary breadwinner and what is needed to take care of those children if you don't have custody. So it, it doesn't mean that you, it goes away. It just means it's more equitable and who actually gets, if you're caring for your children and you're not the primary breadwinner, then you do need support. And it, if you're a man and you aren't, I, I've seen, I've actually, I've seen this happen. Like I have friends who's, they got a divorce and they made more than their husband, but the husband has, has joint custody. So they have to provide support. You know, it, it happens. And mm -hmm. that's a good thing. It's a good thing that we have more equity in our system and it doesn't take away. It just means that more people are eligible to be, to benefit from the stat, from the laws that we have in place. Um, and it makes it more equal. I saw a movie last night, 50 for 50 by 450. It's about yeah. women um, on the national, women leaders on the national level, presidents, prime ministers and the like. And in, in a lot of countries, they, they don't really look at mother and father, they look at parental. And so when you take out mother and father, that you take out the gender lens of things, then you have parental rights. You have parental, um, parental leave. And we see that men are able to invest in their families more. It's an obscene amount of men feel like they can't take parental leave when it's offered to them because society says that you can't. Mm -hmm. They could, but because there's the, we have this idea in mind about what makes a man, what a man is as a breadwinner, it really does harm our families and it harms our future and our and, and the and children and men and everyone involved in that situation. So that's mm -hmm. why it, it doesn't take away, but it adds and it brings more people into the picture of who is protected under that under that amendment. Right. I think that's so important because I think a lot of people don't understand that and they're very concerned about it. Some people will lose if the ERA is, is passed. Um, no, we, we all win. That's the beautiful part about it. Right. Um, this is, I mean, I know this is something you hope does not have to happen, but um, is there any path to sort of start anew with Congress passing, uh, you know, a new amendment that would have uh, I'll ask you that question. What do you think? <laughs> I'll ask everyone here, right? So unfortunately, we know the society in which we live right now, it is so polarized. Everyone, you can't even get members of Congress to agree that the sky is blue when it is, right? Everyone has to have their nuanced shade because we have, we're have we so partisan and, and the politics is just, the partisanship and the divisiveness is just run, run rampant. And I know a lot of Republicans actually like to use Ruth Bader Ginsburg actually said we should start over. But she said that before we had the 38th state ratify. And we're in a very different landscape now than we were when she made that statement. But it keeps getting thrown in our face. And we're like, we love RBG. She's phenomenal. I actually got to meet her. It was great. Um, but that was a very different landscape. And until we get to a place where our part politics are not so partisan and polarized, we're not going to be able to do this again. This is their best shot to get it done. And we, we can get it done. We just need to get people motivated to do the right thing and show them why it's in their best interest to do so. Mm -hmm. um, so we have uh, another question uh, who first a student who first thanks you for sharing your experience and your vision um, and wonders how do you think um, an advocate would respond or should respond to a white man who is arguing that these efforts do not involve him or that it is not his fight? Um, so does he have a wife who works? Does he have a daughter? Does he have a son? 
-hmm. If he doesn't have any of those things, it's a, it's a different conversation, but if he has anyone he cares about who is negatively impacted by this, then that's why. So if, if your wife, or if you all can't, couldn't get childcare because there's not universal childcare in this country, which means one of you had to, couldn't work because it wasn't worthwhile for you to actually take time off to, to raise your kid, or I'm sorry, you couldn't go to work because it, you couldn't make enough money to pay for childcare, that affects, you, that affects your bottom line. Mm -hmm. If you have a daughter who um, might find herself pregnant at some point in her life, or a son who might find that he impregnated someone at some point in their life and they're not ready to have a family, would you take them to get an abortion? Would you have to leave your state to take them to get an abortion? Because you because there are bans in the state in which you live. If you have a trans child at home, I mean, but I mean, there, there are a number of reasons why personally, like for family members, but for him himself, would he wanted to help out with his kids more? Would he want to take be free to take time off of work and not be penalized for it to do so, to take care of his family? Would he want to be free of the gendered stereotypes that lock all of us in by this toxic masculinity that some of us see in, around us and that continues to perpetuate because of these gendered stereotypes that are found their way into our laws? It, imagine a world where we're free of much of that because our because our systems, we're trying to tear down the systems that enforce that on us. We're all in prison in many ways and folks just don't see it. You have to make it relatable to them. Say, this is why... If, even if it doesn't directly impact you, though it does, it, it you have to be able to see beyond your lived experience and understand that it's impactful for everyone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think, again, that fear-mongering has been so uh, powerful that people uh, just have a sense that this is going to either, you know, destroy what they have or it doesn't impact me because it's just some sort of marginal, uh, you know, group of uh, feminists that are concerned about this. Um, mm -hmm. And I think it's so important what you're doing to make it clear that not only does this impact a broad array of rights, but it really does impact everybody. Um, so uh, another um, question is about uh, really how this coalition that you were talking about, uh, that you're part of and, and are leading in terms of the ERA, you have mentioned so many different rights and things that are impacted. How do you sort of pri prioritize uh, what you focus on? Um, I mean, you mentioned just now that abortion rights is something that is very important uh, and, in, you know, sort of front of mind right now. Um, how do you kind of make decisions as a coalition about how you're going to uh, strategically get this move forward? So everyone in our coalition understands that the Equal Rights Amendment is our main priority. We are the ones driving the effort to, to get it added to the Constitution. But as part of that, we also uplift campaigns for the rest of our partner organizations. So when we have um, Equal Pay Day uh, comes up, we promote Equal Pay Day amongst our partners and our coalition so that everyone is advancing that. We sign on to letters to Congress. We talk to members of the um, the administration as well. So we do uplift those movements as well. We uplift our partners and their issues, but understanding that our main focus is the Equal Rights Amendment. And that's the vehicle through which we're going to achieve this larger vision of equality that we have for the country. And so mm -hmm. everyone understands that that's what we're fighting for. We have all these other, we have the resources that we use are being used to uplift all of our issues because we are so siloed and that's, that's to our detriment. People, the forces that be want to keep us separated because they know that if we come together and we work together, we're much stronger, we're much louder, and we can actually do more. And so that's what we're really building is that that movement of movements coming together to actually push back against the role of rollback of our rights because we don't our our movement is funded in the millions and our opposition is funded in the billions. And so we have people power, and that's what we're going to use to get this to get this thing done. Wow. Um so you had mentioned, you know, several times that you're, the job is just beginning once the ERA gets uh, actually uh, enshrined in the Constitution. Do you see your organization as continuing that fight or is it, uh, you know, it, it, is, your, is your job done in terms of the ERA coalition? No, so we're actually, so we're looking, we're coming up on our 10 year anniversary next year. And so as part of that reflection, we're talking about how can we use our coalition that we built? I mean, we have a massive coalition and we have, and we're growing it every month, every day, actually. Um, how do we use that to actually make the change we wanna see? And so we're refocusing how we're going to work on, on implementation of the Equal Rights Amendment once we have the amendment in the constitution. 
So we are pulling together working groups that are going to, and actually we're, we're doing one today, um, that are really focusing on the different aspects of the work that we do. Electoral work, work on the state level, work on the federal level, and then communications, public education, and awareness. Um, and using those groups to talk about, okay, how do we talk, how do we message the work that we're doing now? And how do we build these, the infrastructure for the work that needs to happen during implementation? So we're looking ahead because we know that we got, we have to get this thing done, but we also need to, to be mindful of what's going to happen next because someone's going to have to take the lead and moving that forward. And we're that organization. Mm, that's great. Um, so in terms of um, the, uh, just the, the fight that you have been part of for so long. Um, what are some surprises that you have found? Um, and maybe what are some rewarding moments uh, that you have found? It's hard to be surprised these days, <laughs> <laughs> to be quite honest with you. And especially so like I've, I've worked in the repro rights space for some time also. So like Dobbs wasn't, we knew Dobbs was coming. It was just a matter of when. Um, and we've seen the stacking of the courts that we've seen. We've seen um, we've seen the polarization of our electorate more and more. Um, so I guess sometimes the surprise is when you get people reaching out that you otherwise wouldn't. I don't know. I, it's, it's, it's small moments. Usually it's when someone that you think has a diff has a particular point of view shocks you by saying the right thing. Right. Um, I can't think of a specific interest, but one, one of the things that I love to see is I love it when people's eyes light up when they tell, when you tell them we don't have an equal rights amendment and they're like, mm -hmm. what? And, and I say, and this is how it, and then they start thinking about how it impacts them. And then they're like, then they go off and they tell everyone else. I was like, did you know, we don't have this? Did you know this, that, and the other, and that spreads. And I love seeing that because that organic um, inquisitiveness and the spreading of, of that, that joy and that energy, not necessarily joy and energy, but the spreading of that awareness and information is really what's going to happen because we are not situated in a way that we can actually communicate to the millions and millions of people that we need to outside of our coalition. But every person who takes the time to talk to 10 more people about this, mm -hmm. that expands our work. Right. Um, so in terms of, you know, again, our audience is a lot of, uh, a lot of it is law students who, again, are interested in this. Um, are, are there, and, and many of them will be looking for jobs soon. <laughs> um, so uh, what are some options, uh, particularly, and I realize, you know, you're not an attorney, but I know you, I know you, you play one on TV. <laughs> apparently. Um, so uh, what are some uh, options uh, for new lawyers who would like to go into this type of work? So I know you have to pay off your law school debt. Um, so find a firm that does pro bono work in the area in which you're interested in. I have a number of friends who did that coming out of law school. They went to big firms that they knew that the pro bono work they do um, is in an area that that speaks to them. And so that's that's one way that they could use their skills and talents to help with that. Volunteer, join a board, go knock doors on a weekend if you like to be active. I mean, sometimes knocking doors when it's not freezing cold outside can be therapeutic, right? You go and you talk to someone and you convince them, not to necessarily convince them, but you have a conversation about something you're passionate about. It's a very different way to, to think of the world outside of, of law school. So I teach the class at, at Georgetown. And every every time my students come in, it's a very different class than what they're used to because I want them to focus on themselves. I want it's a lot very reflect very reflective. Why do you want to run for office? What is what is it that motivates you? What makes you the best person for that job? And they never have to think about themselves. It's a very different way of looking at the world. And so for them, it's it's cathartic in some way because it, it's a break from the mundane from the monotony, even if it's exciting, the, it, from the routine that law school provides for you. So I would say try something, try to find something that finds you joy and do it in a, in a volunteer capacity until you pay off that law school debt. And then yeah. once you do that, um, then you can, I, I know so many people who went to law school who aren't lawyers right now because they found their passion outside of it, but you can still use those skills and that you learn in that capacity and the knowledge that you, that you have and take that into the world and make real change. So yeah. there's so many opportunities out there. Uh, two things. Try something and knowing what you don't like is just as important as knowing what you like and be open to opportunities when they present themselves and, and just take life as it comes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, I think for students, um, they sometimes don't recognize how powerful their voices 
can be um, both while they're still in law school and then obviously when they when they graduate and are lawyers that it's really such a powerful role that you can play um, and it it is incredibly rewarding um, it's something you're actually doing something that you care about that makes a real difference in the world um, and I try to tell my students that as well um, that it's you know something that is just so central to making you feel like a satisfied and a valuable person uh, in in your work um, and, and along those lines before we go on as a law student, you have such skills and talents right now, even before you go off to a firm that you don't realize it's when I was in grad school they, or college, they said, okay, you come from the world and like, you're like here in the top of the world. And then you get to grad school or, or college and you're like everyone else, you're with everyone else in the mix, but then you leave and you're back up here. And so you mm -hmm. have these skills and talents that you can take anywhere while you're still in school that people be, would love to have you use. So I can't stress this enough. Go volunteer right now on a campaign for an organization. I mean, you can join, but we have college students who are on boards. We have grad students who are on boards with me. So you can use your skills, your talents, and your enthusiasm right now as a law student in a way that you find passion. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so I know we're running a little short on time. Um, if anyone has some uh, final questions, if they could put them in the Q&A. And um, in the meantime, uh, I think uh, we really want to emphasize that something you've been talking about, which is this idea that we can't just sort of uh, sit back and watch other people do these things. And maybe you could give um, some other sort of encouraging words uh, to uh, all of the audience, both students and there are a lot of lawyers in the audience and others um, about what we could do um, to get this get this passed. The biggest thing is talking to more people about it. I mean, if you if you if you live in a state like I do, where your representative is is on the is on the right side of the issue, it's sometimes it's hard to you, you can't really call Congress um, a member of Congress elsewhere. Um, but talk to people who are in states who maybe they could call their member of Congress. Have a conversation with someone, and again, don't try to change their mind. Just have a conversation and just try to drop a few nuggets and just keep it moving. Um, mm -hmm. But the more people we know, we talk to who are aware of the situation, aware of the importance of it, and especially in the importance in this moment right now, that's key. Um, so amplifying those voices on social media, um, talking to people who are not on social media, but who have audiences themselves. If you find a way to use your megaphone and your platform in whatever way you can, do it. Because mm -hmm. that's really how it's going to, how we're going to move the needle is the more people who are engaged and involved in this, the the more likely we're going to get it done now instead of having to wait more years down the road. Well, um, I, I really want to thank you so much, really. I, I have found this personally very inspiring and you're doing incredible work. And I know it's also incredibly challenging. And particularly, I, I mean, I'm just, and some of the questions reflected this, I'm just so um, impressed and amazed with, how many different arenas you're working on in the same at the same time you know the congress the archivist the you know states the i mean it's just really incredible and so i think everybody listening to you is very inspired and i really hope that that the law students in the audience really take this to heart because um this issue or whatever your issue is that you're passionate about is you know it's just it, it's so important that you follow that. So I thank you so much, Zakia, for taking the time to uh, to spend time with us. And um, I, uh, I'm i just looking at my, my leaders here. They're saying that we are now supposed to be taking a break, a lunch break until 2 p.m. when we have a terrific panel coming up on transgender rights. So everyone have a good lunch and come back. And Zakia, I hope our paths will cross Again. Thank you. And I would be remiss if I didn't say go to the eracoalition.org to learn more about our work and follow us on social media. Oh, that'd be great. Okay. Thank you so much. All Thank right, you. everybody take care and I'll see you at two. <laughs> Bye everyone. Bye. Good afternoon, everyone. And welcome to the afternoon portion of the Justice for All Symposium. The phrase justice for all dates back to the founding of our country, but it has become increasingly clear that many groups of people are often left out of the all category. 
a person's race, sex, sexual orientation, gender identity, religion, citizenship, ability, age, and or socioeconomic status are just a few of the factors that lock them out of receiving equal tr treatment in our justice system. This morning, we had the pleasure to hear from a panel focusing on Title IX and from our keynote speaker, Sakia Thomas from the ERA Coalition. If you are just joining us, please check out the recording, which will be posted on the Law School's YouTube channel. This afternoon, we have gathered to delve into one of the most pressing and evolving legal issues of our time, the transformation of law in regards to transgender rights and protections for transgender individuals. In recent years, there has been a seismic shift in the legal landscape surrounding transgender rights, marked by both advancements and challenges. This panel will encompass a broad spectrum of legal considerations from education, healthcare, criminal justice, housing, employment, and personal freedoms. The legal rights and challenges facing transgender individuals are multifaceted and they intersect with matters of equality, justice, and human rights. It is crucial to recognize that as society's understanding of gender identity and expression evolves, our legal framework must adapt to ensure that all individuals, regardless of their gender identity, enjoy equal protection under the law. This panel will engage in a thoughtful and constructive dialogue examining recent legal developments, ongoing struggles, and future prospects for the transgender community. Through our collective insights and expertise, we aim to foster a deeper understanding of the challenges transgender individuals face in the legal arena, as well as the steps needed to create a more inclusive and legal and just legal system. We hope that this panel will serve as a platform for illuminating discussions and will contribute the ongoing efforts to shape a more equitable and compassionate world for all transgender individuals. Thank you all for joining us in this critical conversation. Without further ado, I will turn it over to our wonderful moderators, Nicole Dishlevsky and 2L student, Sam Filiaji. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. Um, and to start off with, Sam and I just want to say thank you um, for having this event today. Thank you for allowing us to moderate this panel. We feel really passionately about these topics and really um, thankful to have been included. Um, to start off, Sam and I want to acknowledge that we all find ourselves in different places with these discussions and that's okay. The issues we're gonna to raise today may not be beginner issues in this topic, but we'll try to elicit information in a way that we're all on the same page. Today, we welcome Attorney Hill, Professor Ward, and Professor Weatherby with us. Attorney Hill, thank you for joining this important discussion today. We, of course, want to start out with some introductions about each of our speakers. Attorney Hill, you're the Chief Legal Counsel for the Rhode Island Commission for Human Rights. Could you tell us a bit about yourself, where you're from, and how you fit into this conversation? Uh, thank you for having me, Nicole and Sam and, um, and the law school. Um, so as Chief Legal for the Commission for Human Rights, um, I primarily handle housing discrimination cases, and um, but the commission's enforcement authority extends to discrimination on all protected categories um, based on in housing, employment, public accommodation, credit, and delivery of services. Um, so if a person were to experience discrimination on the basis of sex, sexual orientation, gender, or gender expression, the Commission for Human Rights would be a place where they could come and make a complaint um, and have that complaint investigated. And we have, you know, enforcement authority to, um, you know, take a case to a hearing and um, achieve an outcome for a complainant if there's merit. Um, so that's the lens that I'm coming to this from um, is being the state enforcement agency for anti-discrimination laws. Um, and the other part of your question, I'm sorry, was where where are you from? It was oh, all... um, that should be an easy question. Um, so I've been in Rhode Island for about seven years, um, and before that, I was in um, Arizona. But I, <laughs> before that, I was in Connecticut, and I was a high school teacher. Um, so I'm also coming at this from, um, you know, my my job has an educational component. 
um, that people need to know their rights, be aware of their rights in order to enforce their rights. Thank you so much, Attorney Hill. All right, and then up next, uh, Professor Weatherby, uh, you teach legal right uh, research and writing, employment discrimination, education law, and professional responsibility at the University of Arkansas School of Law. Uh, Professor Weatherby is a prolific scholar and a dedicated teacher, winning University of Arkansas School of Law's inaugural Dean Circle Faculty Award for teaching in 2021. Her research focuses on the intersection between religious exercise and public accommodation laws, First Amendment jurisprudence, and the impact on student speech, hot button school law issues, and emerging legal protections for transgender individuals. Uh, so Professor Weatherby, could you please tell us a little bit about yourself, where you're from, and how you fit into this conversation, please? Sure. Thank you so much for having me, Nicole and um, Sam and Andrea and the whole R view. I'm delighted to be with you today. Um, I, I've been an academic now since 2013. So primarily I've been thinking, doing research and writing about these issues. But prior to joining the Legal Academy, I practiced law in New York for seven years and represented school districts. Um, and so I handled everything education law related, but part of my niche really became, an, and really this was um, somewhat inconsistent with my firm's desire, I, I gave advice against their their liking. They, they wished that I wouldn't have done this at the time, <laughs> but it was in 2007, 2008, before people were really engaged with these issues, and I had districts that were ushering um, gender non-conforming and transi transitioning students through through uh, middle school and high school. And so I, um, along with some really incredible administrators, superintendents and school boards, um, advised with respect to how to handle some of the logistical issues that arose in that context and developed an expertise in the area. And then when I transitioned to legal um, academia, I started writing about it, thinking about it and advocating on behalf of that population. And it's been a great joy um, and privilege to have a small you know, voice in this area, especially in Arkansas, where these topics are, are somewhat controversial. Um, and and that's what I bring to the uh, conversation today. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, Professor Ward, uh, Professor Ward, I think my uh, quick biographical statement is kind of underselling you. Uh, I could start with like John Ward, American legal hero, um, but I'm going to go, uh, John, Professor Ward is a lecturer at uh, Boston University School of Law in 1978. In response to a pattern of police harassment of gay men, he gathered a group of community activists and founded GLAD, Gay and Lesbian Advocates and Defenders, now GLBTQ Legal Advocates and Defenders. Can you tell us a bit about yourself, where you're from, and how you fit into this conversation? First, I have to unmute. Uh, well, you know, actually, um, I'm also teaching the same course that I'm teaching at Boston University now at Boston College Law School. So I have this late life, late life career as an adjunct. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and um, my connection with Rhode Island actually goes back a long way. I clerked for Judge Raymond Patin in the district court uh, in um, 1976 and 1977, which was one of the most uh, rewarding experiences of my life. Judge Patin was a hero <laughs> in my estimation. He took progressive stands about uh, minorities, about draft debaters, about women seeking reproductive freedom, uh, about LGBT folks in the days when it was extremely unpopular and paid a personal price for it. And it was a real inspiration to, to be his law clerk for a year. <clears throat> and um, so yeah, in 1978, I, I did found GLAD. And um, uh, in a, actually, even though on paper, things were much more difficult for LGBT folks in those days, um, I felt that the wind was at our back, uh, that th there was very little to lose because we didn't have very much. Uh, but um, for example, in 1980, I did a case in, actually in front of Judge Patin uh, involving a young man who wanted to go to the prom with another boy. 
and we won that and it was kind of things were on the upswing and they were for a long time so um these are very different times uh and even though much has been achieved i think it's fair to say that we're feeling headwinds more than tailwinds and um so my interest is um in sort of being a bully pulpit for the younger generation and finding ways to, because one of the things that I think has kept the movement going from the beginning is our nimbleness and we're certainly going to need that skill now in terms of transgender folks um you know when when glad was started uh, I, I I in all honesty I can't say that everybody in the gay male and lesbian community was welcoming to to trans folks okay it's been uh, an educational process and i think one of the things that perhaps these difficult times uh, have brought about is if we weren't interested in intersectionality back then it has come to us i mean it's undisputable that what happens to to transgender folks what happens to people of color what happens to immigrants uh and what happens to us <laughs> as as queer folk um, is is all part of one struggle for human liberation, and it's that that inspires me in in my work. Uh, so, oh, and by the way, I'm a recent transplant to Providence, Rhode Island, and I'm really loving living here. <laughs> so, uh, I think that's about all. And. Um, uh, uh, I, I don't, I mean, I, it's very nice to be called a hero, this, that, and the other thing, but um, I'm just one of the voices, you know, and um, uh, the, the more I just keep the focus on the work, the more comfortable I feel. Thank you so much for having me. That's exactly <laughs> what an American legal hero would say. Um, welcome <laughs> to the Ocean State and welcome to our panel. Yes, welcome to Rhode Island, everyone, even virtually as well. So I think we're just going to dive into our questions here. So this first one is just kind of an int introduction to set the stage for everybody, um, kind of two complimentary questions. Uh, what is the current language that academics are now using to talk about transgender issues and transgender people? And what advice would you have for somebody who normally disengages from this topic because they care, but they don't want to seem offensive or disrespectful? And I suppose I'll pass the baton to Attorney Hill. Uh, thank you, Sam. Well, I'm not an academic, so I can't really say, you know, where the academic world is going. I, I would say a couple of things um, that something I'm hearing more now is um, gender diverse as kind of an umbrella term for people who um, just don't fall into a strict binary of, of gender. Um, and I also like that term better than gender non-conforming because I think it puts it into mm. a more positive light as opposed to non-conforming sounds like it's a deficit as opposed to it's just another reality of how human beings live their lives. Um, but as far as like engaging in the topic, um, you know, don't be weird. I think that's like my top thing to say. Like if it's something you wouldn't ask a person who you don't know well, um, you know, regardless of their gender or sex, then you probably shouldn't be asking it to someone who you perceive to be gender diverse. Like, it's just not any of your business what somebody's like sex life is like. Um, <laughs> and the other thing is you're gonna mess up. Um, you know, you're at some point, you're probably going to misgender someone or use the wrong term or use the wrong pronoun. And the thing to do is if you catch it, say, sorry, move on. Um, if they catch it, say sorry and move on um, and try not to do it again. Um, and I, I think, you know, gender diverse people are still people. Um, and we're all a lot more than our sex and our gender. Um, and engaging with people in an effort to find out who they are as a person, um, you know, is generally something that 
won't steer you wrong if you're being genuine and humble about the interaction. Thank you. Uh, Professor Ward or Professor Weatherby, do you have any thoughts? I, I, I would just add, I think everything Lauren said, I agree with. I, I would just add that as an academic, I don't look to other academics. I look to the community for um, the glossary of terms. And actually, I look at GLAD's website often to make sure that I'm staying on top of transition. You know, this is a, a language that's evolving and changing quickly. So if you want to be respectful and be um, on top of terms that are um, sensitive to the community, you're, you're going to, you know, engage with the research and just stay on top of it. To the second question about engaging in the dialogue, I, I think and write a lot about speech tolerance. And I, I think I'll just say that um, it's not just about the fear of engaging in the conversation. It's about how we receive the mistakes. And uh, Lauren mentioned you know, that we're human beings. We make mistakes. Um, I do too. And I think I just always encourage folks to give each other grace. Um, there's going to be outdated non-PC terms that some people are going to use because the terminology is evolving so quickly. And the fear of causing someone offense can often be the reason why folks don't engage in the first place or speak up. And so what ends up happening is that the conversation shuts down rather than people feeling comfortable engaging. Um, without being vilified for getting it wrong. So I would just encourage people to show grace, you know, um, be uh, forgiving in terms of mistakes that others make and not vilify an individual for maybe a, uh, using a term that is outdated or incorrect or insensitive and e try to educate that person in a respectful way so that as Lauren said, the next time they they get it right, um, because we can make mistakes, but we learn from them. And um, I think it's important that everybody shows some tolerance uh, when diving into a conversation that can be sensitive to to listeners. Um, um, I, I uh, would just amplify that and um, my students both at Boston College and at Boston University are completely enthralled by trans issues. That's what they want to talk about <laughs> yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And um, particularly now because these cases that are coming down, which I imagine we'll get a chance to talk about a little bit later, um, Scrimetti and, and uh, the ECNIS, uh, the, the Sixth and Eleventh Circuit cases, and the horrible uh, way that the courts are treating the issue of uh, uh, appropriate medical care for transgender teenagers um, uh, has put it right at the forefront. And um, so, and in terms of the pronoun wars, um, uh, <laughs> yeah, I think the older you are, the, the more difficult it is to adjust. And so I, I make mistakes. I have trouble, to be honest, with um, remembering about they because it's just, but you know, uh, it's like what I tell myself is, John, just get over it, you know. And uh, uh, the for people, you know, we're going to actually teach those cases next week. The the uh, Otto case and a couple of other cases that talk about professors uh, that refuse to call people by their 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 chosen pronouns. And I mean, you know, we have no trouble going into court and, and uh, saying your honor. <laughs> or, and in some languages, you know, the third person is used as a term of respect. And so what is the big deal? <laughs> That's my view on it. Thanks so much. Um, so we're going to, as Andrea said, we're going to jump around a, a bit on our, our questions because we have so much ground to cover. Um, so we're going to start with education and Professor Ward um, we're going to bring you back to Rhode Island. Um, you successfully vindicated the right of a Rhode Island high school senior boy to bring another boy as his prom date. Can you describe the opposition's argument and how your strategy addressed it? 
And uh, do you think the same arguments would be made today? Um, okay, I just want to just add to what I said about the pronouns. Stuff. It's not to trivialize it. I mean, when you're talking, this is about people's human dignity and their right to be addressed as they as they choose. I want to be clear about that. That's not okay. So, getting back to Aaron Frick, um, the defense was basically that um, the, the the principal of of the high school disavowed any any uh, intent to discriminate against Aaron on the basis of his sexual orientation, but he said he feared violence, okay? And that was the, basically the defenses. We're afraid that if we let this kid go to the dance with another kid uh, of the same gender, um, the other students will uh, engage in violent conduct. Uh, and so our job was to convince Judge Patine that that wasn't, uh, a good enough reason. And we talked to him about uh, you can't allow people to have a heckler's veto over First Amendment activities. And that, uh, you know, and we actually went back and discovered that there had been security issues at the Cumberland High School prom in previous years having nothing to do with sexual orientation and that, that they were able to provide security and do all that stuff. And actually, as it happened, the, the thing, the prom went without incident. Um, I remember being up late the night before, making sure that they both, that their tuxedo orders were <laughs> properly filled and so forth and so on. But the thing, the thing went fine. And um, uh, it was <clears throat> actually, uh, there, there was, after that case was one, it got a lot of publicity back then. And uh, there was a, a TV program called the Phil Donahue Show and Aaron was on, I don't know if, I, I guess people remember. And so, you know, for months afterwards, my office would get letters from kids all over the country saying, gee, I thought I was the only one, the only teenager who was, you know. So it was, um, it, it's one of the cases that I look back on with, with the greatest fondness because, you know, I think it was part of what brought a, began the long process of social change that's made life easier. Uh, one of the things that gratifies me when I teach uh, is that my students uh, don't apparently have the same nonsense in their head that I grew up with for the most part. And that that is progress, regardless of what the right wing is doing these days. So uh, that is the hope. Um, that is the hope that the next generation and the generation after that don't have the same um don't have the same internalized hatred or internalized barriers or internalized guilt um but that is also the hope going forward that you know we're continue to march in the right direction and so thanks in a difficult time on a difficult topic um thanks thanks for sharing that um attorney ward um sam to you yeah, thank you. And I especially appreciate it, your point about, you know, people thought that they were the only one and that would they would be alone. And so especially as far as being gender diverse and like being in that space, uh, it's really important to remember that there's people before you and that there will be people at, uh, after you and that there are people by your side that have that same experience. So thank you for pointing that out too. Well, uh, I, I, yeah. Oh, excuse me, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Go oh, ahead. No, of course not. Go ahead. Uh, I was just going to say one of the things that that I sense sometimes in my classes is that uh, my students, I don't ask anybody's sexual orientation, but my sense is that most of them are are queer one way or the other, and, and uh, be either in terms of their gender identity or in, in, in their sexual orientation or whatever, but that they tend to minimize the degree of oppression that still exists. And I can understand that. I mean, it's a you know, it's a, it's it's a survival technique, and it's just you know, we, we're a lot of other things besides our gender identity or our sexual orientation, and you don't. But um, I find it that, that I need a little bit to tease that out of them because it's still there. We're not, you know, there's still. I mean, the cases that are coming down from the Supreme Court, you know seek to perpetuate second class citizenship. The ways may be a little bit more subtle or you can always go and get another wedding cake, blah, 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 but it's still there. And so uh, I think it's important to, to have a bit of that edge, you know, especially for lawyers, regardless of whether you, you go into the movement or you, whatever you do, you know, bring, 
my bully pulpit is bring that with you, bring that concern, you know, because it's a clue in the struggle for human liberation, you know, so. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, and like on the topic of students feeling safe in school uh, that are gender diverse or queer in some way, uh, bullying is a huge issue and often goes hand in hand with any sort of type of discrimination. Um, particularly in Rhode Island, the Rhode Island Safe uh, School Act provides a statewide bullying uh, policy which defines bullying as the use by one or more students of a written, verbal, or electronic expression or a physical act or gesture or any combination thereof directed at a student. So this policy seems to protect students from other students, but not so much students from teachers or vice versa. And I know that the concept of mandatory reporting in a school um, is a large issue. So um, I know like if anyone wants to jump in or uh, speak to kind of that as far as what students are facing to feel safe in schools or what gender diverse teachers might be concerned about. So I can speak to the legal landscape in Rhode Island. Um, so you're correct that the language in um, the Safe Schools Act is a little underdrafted. Um, and, but I will say that um, if someone is experiencing harassment or discrimination from a teacher or another student in their school, K-12 or university, you can report that as a Title IX violation. So to the, to the um, I think it's the Office of Civil Rights um, at the Department of Ed. And if you're at the university level, you can report that to your Title IX office. Um, I think when we think about sexual harassment, we think about it in the really like traditional men and women in the workplace sense, but it's much broader than that. Um, the challenge with that is that there may be some, I think there was a Supreme Court case recently that called into question being able to collect on emotional damages arising from a Title IX claim um, and having to prove actual like compensatory damages from something that's largely an emotional event is kind of challenging. Um, I will say in state law, like you, um, like you said, Sam, it's a little more of a patchwork um, in addition to the state law, RIDE, the Department of Education, the Rhode Island Department of Education, um, has a regulation that requires all the school districts to have a comprehensive anti-bullying policy, um, and it sets out what needs to be in that policy, but then it delegates developing the specific policies to the school districts. So if your school district um, is interested in having a really robust policy, that's you know easy to report and you know offers a high degree of protection to gender diverse students then you could have a really good experience conversely you know school districts could sort of slow roll it or you know offer lesser protection or just make it way more difficult to um, to protect your own rights and to report um, so your experience may vary depending on where you go to school um, but per those regulations, it doesn't matter whether it's a student and student, a student and teacher, or even a student harassing a teacher, um, that it should cover everybody. Yeah, absolutely. And thank you for, for clarifying uh, those parts as well. I think I'm going to turn it over to Nicole here. Professor Weatherby, you unmuted yourself. Did you want to respond? Oh, yeah, I just wanted to say one thing, and it was, um, we're taking a step back to something John said. Um, I think when it comes to legal change, it's often two or three step, steps behind social acceptance and social tolerance, and we keep seeing a delay or a lag in the law. And um, my hope is, as I see students come through my classroom, even in the conservative state in which I teach, I'm seeing more progressive, more open-minded acceptance and tolerance. And so I'm hopeful, I'm an eternal optimist, and, and I'm hopeful that with this next generation and the good work that Professor Ward is doing and that Lauren's doing, and all the advocates that are working so hard to raise awareness on these issues, that we do have a sea change legally, but it's gonna 
going to be behind a lot of social and cultural work. And, and so I just wanted to say that um, to the question, the discussion we had a couple minutes ago. And then with respect to bullying and um, anti harassment or discrimination policies, it very much depends on the jurisdiction and the district. Um, I represented schools in New York and the law is pretty strong there, actually, and um, or it is now, I should say, it's evolved. But um, oftentimes, bullying and harassment or discrimination overlap, especially when it involves uh, gender diverse students because of Title IX's prohibition against sex discrimination and the way that that term has been interpreted by DOE. And so there is protection for students that fit into the the binary or even the spectrum but for students that that don't that are bullied for other reasons that may not be recognized in those categories it can be tricky and um, again it comes back to local administrators and educators to be protective to um, identify what's going on in the classroom and to um, you know, give the students a voice in terms of raising complaints and dealing with it at the school district level before it raises to the level of a legal complaint and it winds up before Lauren. <laughs> so, um, you know, I think it really depends heavily on the administrators and the work they're doing. And a lot of that is education. And I used to go into school districts and talk to administrators because these were novel issues at the time I was in practice. Now they're more commonplace. But I think that leadership from the top needs to be sensitive and aware of these issues. And the superintendents often set the tone for everything that comes below. So that's the only thing I'd add to, to the conversation. Thanks, Professor. And, Weathers. Uh, I would just say, um, it, you have to, the administrators need to have that as a value. So, um, and that's where I see like some of this being very difficult. Uh, mm -hmm. Attorney Hill, did you want to- Oh, I just wanted to say one other thing is, you know, building on what um, Professor Weatherby said, um, that it, you know, it, it has to do with a systemic policy in your school that is not a one-off and there's the education component. One of the other things required by the regulations is to have annual trainings for staff. Um, and, you know, there's some really good providers here in the state, Thunder Mist and GLAD, among others. And so they have some idea of whether, you know, the um, school districts are fulfilling that requirement to provide training for their um, teachers. But it can't just be, we have this wonderful written policy, look how great it is. It has to be sort of a continuous, are we living up to what's in this po policy and enforcing it. Um, um, I just wanted to, to add that the other setting where uh, abuse of transgender individuals is systemic is the prison system. Um, Glad a few years ago was able for the first time in Massachusetts to place a transgender woman in Framingham in the women's prison. Uh, after she spent a number of years under horrendous conditions in, in uh, Concord. Um, and uh, the correctional authorities in Massachusetts, kind of in response to that, I would argue, uh, slapped a, a charge of indecent assault on her. And uh, working with another lawyer, we were able to, to get that charge dropped, but it's just the hostility in that setting uh, uh, is is in in a, in a liberal state like Massachusetts and in other states that are not quite so liberal uh, is unbelievable uh, from some of the other inmates from lack of education from the from the attitude of the correctional officers from the attitude of the top officials uh, you know and, and in California where they have a, a law requiring gender appropriate placement. Uh, you know, the war cry has been, the men are coming. There's this canard, this this completely, basically baseless idea that that men are masquerading as women to get into women's prison. It's just, 
you know, it's just to, to say it is, to, to, it's just nonsensical. But so it's, it's an area that really, because, you know, prisoners, uh, they, 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 they take it on the chin in ways that, that, that and, and kids, you know, I mean, in, in a sense, they're, they're not so different. You know, they're at the low end of the power totem pole. And so uh, I, I just wanted to say that that, that work too was important, you know. Uh, sure. and, 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 and I'm sorry, and, and the, the thing about kids, I mean, it's just uh, what's happening to, to kids in school, uh, despite wonderful efforts, you know, here in Rhode Island and in other places, um, it's, um, uh, to me, it's heartbreaking. Um, you sort of presaged our question to you, uh, about the, um, gender appropriate facilities. Um, so I'm going to skip to, uh, criminal justice and just keep it going. Um, Professor Ward, historically, gender diverse people have been targeted by legislation and by police enforcing that legislation, the most famous example being the Stonewall riots, but police um, being called on or confronting people that appear queer is still rampant. Um, based on your experiences, what do you think needs to happen to build or rebuild trust between the LGBT community and law enforcement? <laughs> where, where do you begin? Uh, I mean, I think it's very, uh, it's lo locale specific. Some places are better and some places are worse than others. And um, I mean, it it sort of leads into the the larger question of uh, of how we, envision and manage policing in this country uh, and how we envision and imagine the role, if any, of incarceration. And uh, I, I, I honest, to be honest, I don't know where to begin. I mean, you know, um, in, 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 and I, I'm sure that 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 both uh, Professor we Weatherby and Attorney Hell have, have experienced the same thing. I mean, sometimes you're just kind of reduced to saving one soul at a time, <laughs> perhaps even if it's only your own. And so, in terms of systemic change, um, uh, I'm not the guy to ask. I wish I were. I wish I had the magic bullet. Uh, but maybe you other folks have something to say on that. So one of the things that I'm incredibly proud of at our institution is that we have a required class in the second year called Race and the Foundations of American Law. Um, and mm -hmm. we uh, teach our students about prison abolition. Um, and to me, that that is uh, uh, it, it, when we're asking these questions about uh, trust and policing, when we're asking questions about gender diverse people and the obstacles they face. Um, in the prison industrial complex, I at least like sleep better at night knowing that we have a class where we don't shy away from teaching students about prison abolition. We have mm -hmm. a class on where that is part of what they read about, just like they read cases, they read a, a you know a, about prison abolition, and I'm, I'm we bring in speakers, and I'm really really proud of that. But to your point, systemic change is slow going and hopeless at times. But again, I at least feel like while going forward, maybe things will be better. Um, Sam, did you wanna take the next question? Yeah, of course. And and thank you for, for those thoughts too. It's definitely a hard place to even know where to start. And uh, kind of like uh, talking about housing and just like not just prisons, but public accommodations in general, Professor Weatherby, I know that that's one of your many areas of expertise. So could you please explain what a public accommodation is and the facilities that that term includes? And then uh, as a part three, if that's not too much, uh, why are they a hot button in anti-discrimination and anti-gender discrimination? 
Sure, I'd be happy to. So public accommodations are essentially businesses and other institutions that provide general public the general public with goods and services. So we think about libraries, schools, gas stations, um, hotels, um, retail stores, movie theaters, all the places that we patronize on a daily basis, um, hospitals. And currently federal and state laws are designed to protect certain protected individuals, groups of individuals from discrimination to protect minorities access to places of public accommodation. So if a business or other institution in, in a jurisdiction that requires access to public accommodations fails to provide ac access equally, that's a violation of the anti-discrimination laws. Um, for example, if a gas station has public restrooms, then those public restrooms are protected um, by that jurisdiction's public accommodation laws. Um, so federal laws like Title VII, Title IX prevent discrimination involving public accommodations. Um, what well, your other question? I'm sorry, I forgot. Yeah, no problem at all. So then like, I think that's a great explanation for what um, public accommodations, law and customs. So then why is this such a hot button topic for gender diverse people and those rights? Right. So the court recently held that workplace anti discrimination laws cover uh, gender identity and sexual orientation insofar as Title VII covers um, uh, prohibits discrimination in the workplace um, based on the term sex. But the court expressly made clear that it was not covering all areas of public accommodation. So <laughs> there's still some question about whether this in, this includes public restrooms and locker rooms. And um, so it, it kind of remains clear, at least um, with respect to federal law, how uh, places of public accommodations should comply um, in terms of a access to those facilities. But the bulk of um, the bulk of anti discrimination protections does come in terms of public accommodation laws from state and local laws. Um, and I think most cities in the country now have some protections against discrimination in places of public com accommodation on the basis of sex. Um, so if you're in a state with a, a, a robust public accommodation law, then you have, you know, more grounds to challenge lack of access based on sexual orientation or gender identity. If you're in a jurisdiction that doesn't have as great of a law, um, then then you're you're at more at risk. Um, and I think those are some of the issues that, you know, come up in this context and then based on whoever, whatever, uh, whoever's in um, power in terms of in Washington, um, for example, tr tr President Trump participated in restrictions on bathroom and locker room usage by executive order overturning some of President Obama, uh, um, uh, his administration's executive orders, and it just depends um, uh, at that level who's um, in the White House. <laughs> so there's a lot there, but um, uh, the court's jurisprudence at this point doesn't, it hasn't clarified that locker room and restroom usage in all places of public accommodation should be open and available to all. Mm -hmm. Thanks so much. You did a great job of contextualizing it and teeing up our next question for Attorney Hill. Uh, you know, uh, Professor Weatherby said, okay, but this, a lot of these protections are state protections. And so I guess our question is about Rhode Island. Uh, so there is a housing crisis in Rhode Island. It's a nationwide problem. It's also a local problem. Um, in Rhode Island, are there any protections for tenants against discrimination for gender identity or expression? Are there any gaps in that protection? Um, what And what recourse is there if someone believes they're being discriminated against based on their gender expression or gender identity? Um, so the short answer to that question is yes. Um, it is illegal for a, um, a housing provider to discriminate against someone on the basis of their sex, sexual orientation, gender, or gender expression in housing across 
a number of things, you know, refusing to rent to them, um, charging them more, offering them different um, privileges or facilities, uh, harassment, whether that be your neighbor harassing you, if your landlord is aware of it and doesn't take any action to stop it, um, retaliation for making a complaint um, uh, about a unfair housing practice. Um, and then of course the Federal Fair Housing Act has comparable product protections. Um, yeah, there is an exception though. So there's something that we call the Mrs. Murphy exception. Um, and Mrs. Murphy is this hypothetical little old lady who decides to rent out some of her house to tenants to make extra pocket money, um, this sort of fictional person. And so it's an exemption for um, housing accommodations that are owner occupied and fewer than four units. So if that happens to be your living situation, that person, the your landlord, that property is not subject to the Fair Housing Practices Act. What I will say is there are a couple of exceptions to the exception. Um, discriminatory advertisement, regardless of the type of accommodations, is prohibited. You couldn't put an advertisement in the paper saying uh, cisgender hetero people only. That would not be okay. Um, and then there's also no exemption for race, according to HUD. Um, obviously, that doesn't help if you don't belong to a protected racial category and you, um, you know, are a gender diverse person. Um, so the recourse, though, if, if this if you believe this has happened to you and you're in a housing provider that's covered, um, you can make a complaint to the Commission for Human Rights. Um, you could make a complaint to HUD, but they'd probably refer it to us. Um, and you that's a very simple thing to do. You can walk in and fill out a form. You can fill out a form on our website. You can send an email, you can call. Um, any way you wanna report that, um, you can make a report to us and we'll investigate um, that allegation. Um, and there's a number of remedies that are available to you um, if you've been discriminated against on the basis of your sex or gender. Thanks. Um, yeah, Attorney Ward, did you want, or sorry, yeah, Nicole, yeah. I'm, I'm thinking about, there was a case recently in Colorado, uh, a transgender person went to Jack Phillips, the guy who refused to bake a cake for uh, the same-sex wedding couple, and asked him to um, bake her uh a birthday cake and so far so good and then she said i want it to be pink and blue so far so good and then she explained that that would symbolize for her her transition okay and at that point he said no i won't bake it right I mean, I'm, I'm simplifying the story but that's the bottom line so she went to court and she won both in the district court in Colorado, which has an anti-discrimination law that protects people on the basis of, of gender identity. And she won in the appeals court. It's now before the Colorado Supreme Court. My fear is that if it gets to the United States Supreme Court, she will not do well because the free exercise clause of the First Amendment is being used actively as a sword by a very, very, very well-funded group who call themselves Christian, although I would dispute the applicability of that term, uh, the, the Lawyers Defending Freedom, the Beckett Foundation, all of these groups that are seeking to use uh, religious beliefs as, as a basis for overturning the anti-discrimination laws, and that's their ultimate goal. So, I mean, uh, yeah, this is a serious problem going forward. A serious problem going forward. I mean, it's not. Uh, we just in class discussed the 303 uh, creative case where uh, the, the, this woman uh, wasn't even doing websites for for marriage uh, for for people getting married, but planned to do so in the future and feared that she would be violating the uh, Colorado anti discrimination law, which forbids. Uh, discrimination against LGBT folks. And uh, she won in the United States Supreme Court on the basis that she was being compelled to speak a message that 
uh, violated her beliefs and um, uh, sort of tagging along to that. The reason it, uh, it, was, it wasn't a free exercise claim, it was a free speech claim, but nevertheless, you get the idea, you know. And uh, what the what the what the fallout of that is going to be is yet to be determined. But it's it's uh, the, the current composition of the Supreme Court has an agenda. Uh, I mean, I think there's no doubt about that. And and when I talk about headwinds, that's a lot of what I'm thinking about. And um, so the times are perilous in that respect because they they may have lost their prestige, the Supreme Court, but they haven't lost their power. I'm sorry to get out my soapbox, but I'm pretty exercised about this. No, that's that's very well put. Well put, and especially as like someone that's like just younger, or earlier in their career, like what the Supreme Court is currently doing and how they're behaving is definitely kind of throwing everything into a tailspin as far as like what we think that we can expect or what we think that we can ask for uh, and ask for what we deserve as well. And in those protections too, uh, I kind of want to shift to the category of employment. So. Um, just kind of a basic question, speaking to like balancing personal freedoms with somebody's, um, you know, just rights to not be discriminated against. Um, is an employee getting fired for purposefully not honoring a coworker's pronouns uh, or a preferred name, a violation of free speech? Or on the other hand, could an employee claim discrimination by their employer uh, if their coworkers are allowed to purpose purposely misgender them or call them by um, the wrong name. So I don't know if Attorney Hill would, I see you unmuted. Sure. Um, so, I mean, as far as getting fired, that's really up to the employer. Um, and a lot of times an employer will see, um, you know, that if an employee is harassing another employee, they're going to try to manage their risk by firing that person. Um, so, you know, from an economic point of view, that may be how it plays out, but I don't, as far as, is that discrimination, does that rise to the level of being like an unfair employment practice? Um, I don't think it would happen from an isolated incident. You make one mistake where you dead name someone or you use the wrong pronoun. Um, but if it's a, a you know, purposeful, ongoing, that that could be harassment and that could be um, actionable under the Fair Employment Practices Act or Title Seven. I think is right. Um, and, you know, if the, again, if the employer is aware that that's happening and has, um, or provides cover or like permission, then the employer could be liable for that employee's actions as well. So, yeah, I think under the current state of the law, you you could um, definitely be able to report that as harassment in the workplace. Um, um, can I add to that? So I think it also depends on whether the employer is a private employer or a public employer. In the private context, um, you know, employers can have policies, and this goes to your question about whether an employee can be terminated for failing to comply with a policy regarding pronoun usage or, or name usage. In the private context, I think it would be uh, easier for the employer to terminate based on failure to comply with uh, a workplace policy. In the public space, then we get into the, you know, government actors cannot discriminate on the basis of religious belief and other things, as Professor Ward spoke to earlier. And so we find ourselves in that tense, that tension between religious exercise and um, a, uh, a, a policy that is to respect students, for example, in a public school, a public university setting, um, gender identity or expression. And so the courts are kind of all over the place <laughs> in terms of how they handle this. Um, Mary Weather versus Hardtop is a case from the Sixth Circuit that dealt with a public uh, professors, and this is in an institution of higher education, right to um, refrain from complying with the university's policies regarding um, regarding pronoun usage. 
And the issue became whether it was government speech under the government speech doctrine, and then whether there was a um, professor's um, academic freedom exception there, and the court sided with the professor. And then in the um, K through 12 context, there's a case actually from 2023 in the Seventh Circuit that said that a school teacher's religious freedom exercise um, objection to complying with a um, school district policy regarding uh, gender and pronoun usage was not a reasonable accommodation for his sincerely held religious beliefs. So it's kind of a, <laughs> um, a patchwork of legal frameworks in terms of how the courts are dealing with this. And I think until we have some clear um, guidance from the Supreme Court, which I agree is not friendly to these issues, um, you know, the courts of appeals are kind of all over the place. Can I, can I ask you a follow-up question, Professor Weatherby? Sure. Um, you, you teach in Arkansas um, and your scholarship focuses on emerging legal protections for transgender individuals. Um, and I don't want to put you on the spot, but I also uh, am really curious, how does that go together? Do you, is there social pressure? Are there other pressures to keep some of this work out of your classroom or uh, uh, however you want to answer that you're, com that you're comfortable? Sure, I can, I can give you, um, you know, pretty um, honest answer. When I, when I moved here in 2013, the city of Fayetteville was undergoing a battle about a uh, local ordinance. This was um, before the Supreme Court took up the issue to extend anti-discrimination protections in the workplace, places of public accommodation and housing to folks in the LGBTQ community. And they asked me to draft an ordinance and I did. And I got death threats um, for working on, on that subject matter, for being an advocate for the community, for speaking about it publicly. None of this came from my colleagues here at the law school, you know, that support me and, and um, encourage me to engage in this work, but from individuals in the community. We have a very conservative, very, um, religious, deeply religious community. And, um, you know, some of the folks that Professor Ward spoke of earlier have a lot of money here in Arkansas. Um, the Duggars are a big influence here. They have a, I don't know if you guys know who the Duggars are, but they were on the Learning Channel and had a um, reality TV show. And they've- Professor Weatherby, if you knew me even a little, you would not need to ask as I am addicted to reality <laughs> TV. And the fact that you are bringing up the Duggars, both makes my heart sing and makes me feel bad for everyone listening because all I want to do is ask you Duggar questions. Okay. <laughs> well, um, I'm so happy. There was a People Magazine edition. This is back in 2013. I'll have to send it to you. And it was my face next to hers, Miss Duggar. And because she was sending out robocalls, there were robocalls with her voice on it, telling people not to support the ordinance and naming me they called me the Jewish lawyer from New York. Um, and so, yeah, I got some hate mail. I got some death threats. We got the local police involved. And there were times where I felt unsafe. Having said that, a lot has changed in 10 years. A lot has changed, both for the better and for the worse. And I don't feel unsafe anymore. I mean, I did when I was really active and, and involved in the writing of the ordinance. Um, we ultimately put the ordinance up for a vote, which I inherently disagree with because you never want to put civil rights up for um, the majority of citizens to vote on other and a minority civil rights. But we felt like politically that was the best way to get buy in from the community. Um, it actually passed um, and we were very excited. And then it found it, it was. Um, at the heart of a lawsuit uh, after the legislature passed a law that prohibited municipalities from carving out broader and more expansive anti-discrimination protections for populations that weren't already covered by state anti-discrimination laws. 
So it was a long le legal battle. But to your question, um, I feel supported by my my colleagues. I feel supported by the university. I feel supported by my students. But it it, it has been met with um, a lot of criticism. Um, the bakers from Oregon who refused to bake a wedding cake for a same sex couple came to visit Fayetteville during this time. And it was an open rally and I decided to go I was going to just sit in the back and listen, you know it's always good to listen to the opposition I just wanted to hear what they had to say. And there were cameras there and one of the individuals who um, was very active and involved with the Duggars and their community that were opposing the ordinance came up to me and started screaming obscenities at me and telling me that I was advocating in my scholarship for cutting the genitals off of young children and and you know just horrible things and it made the nightly news and it <laughs> the event happened to be in a church um and they called the police and had me escorted out so i had to call my dean that night and say um dean leads i'm so sorry but you may see me on the nightly news getting escorted out of a church i'm so sorry <laughs> um so I guess those are some of my personal experiences that shed light on the fact that these issues in this part of the country are highly controversial and people have very deep feelings about it. And we have a legislature that's very hostile. So, um, I think so, you get some votes as legal heroine, hero. Oh, not at all, not sugar, at all. <laughs> but, and also, it is the case, I believe, that the Arkansas legislature passed a law forbidding appropriate uh, uh, gender affirming care for teenagers and a federal judge appointed by Donald Trump, no less, yes. sensitive opinion, striking down that law. So go figure. I right? know. <laughs> So I was just going to say on a personal note, I'm originally from um, Tulsa, Oklahoma, which is about 90 miles from Fayetteville and um, grew up in a um, in a similar religious environment as a child um, and would have been one of those people holding a sign in a church. Um, when you're confronted with the evidence, when you're confronted with actual human beings, you can change your mind. I changed my mind. Other people can change their minds. Um, so I think that's a point in engaging in the conversation. I think, was it Professor Weatherby who said not to confront or try to change anyone's mind, but to have the conversation with them? Yeah, I think it's just really important to have the conversation and especially healthcare is like one of like, maybe the hottest um, area in this topic, which can really be saying something. Um, so I know like Professor Ward, you had mentioned some cases about um, just like healthcare decisions being scrutinized and even the broader theme of this panel, healthcare decisions can tend to fall under more resistance when they have to do with a person's gender. Like even if uh, a woman wants to explore permanent birth control that hasn't had children yet, like that can be a very big obstacle to, to cross. And particularly with um, transgender people that want to seek hormone replacement therapy. And that's a decision between them and their doctor that the courts and legislature are intervening in. So I don't know if we wanted to continue that conversation a little bit more in depth at all. Well, well, just, I mean, it's a very fraught conversation, but, you know, it's a, it's a long tradition. I mean, Pierce versus Society of, of Sisters is about 100 years old now, and they're strong, uh, and Yoder versus Wisconsin, the right of parents to control or to, 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 to supervise the, the, the care and upbringing of their children is no, no one even the most right-wing person can deny that that's uh, deeply rooted in, in in tradition and part of substantive due process. And so you would think it would be an easy case, but 
You know, I think one of the things that bothers me about the current trend in the Supreme Court is that just as a lawyer, I really detest bad craftsmanship. And some of these cases, you, you know, that are coming down, they're just, they're making it up as they go along. And if I had a student doing that, I'd give them, I'm pretty, I'm a pretty easy grader, but I'd give them a very bad mark, you know. Um, I just, I'm, I am proud of Judge Moody in the Eastern District of Arkansas, who authored the uh, opinion um, upholding the ban on Arkansas's ban on transgender affirming care, and then the Eighth Circuit upheld that, that and, and, and that's huge for this part of the country. Um, and of course, the Sixth Circuit and the Eleventh Circuit went the opposite direction. So now we have a split in the circuits. And, and um, they petitioned for cert, you know, in this or many in the Sixth Circuit case. Uh, so I don't know whether. I know, and it's very scary. It's very, very scary post Dobbs to think about what this court could do with that issue. Because yeah. um, they, I think, Scrimetti cited Dobbs as you know. It's just right. Yeah. yeah. The other case that they cite all the time is the case that I did before the United States Supreme Court, Hurley versus the Hurley case, which oh, the gift that keeps on giving. I mean, it's just, you know. <laughs> uh, on the other hand, you might get a surprise like Bostock. That's yes. True. So, you know, because that was not the way that I expected that case to go. I mean, best summarized as saying, well, duh, of course it protects people who right. are gender diverse. But me too, I thought, oh, that's crazy. That's never gonna happen. Yeah. But you, 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 you never know, but uh, I mean- There's there my eternal optimism. We might all be surprised. Well, <laughs> Let's uh, hope. Unfortunately, there's a lot of- Aren't you muted yourself to say something positive. Like, wow, thanks. Well, okay, okay. In, in Hyde Park, a working class district of Boston, there is now being built a repurposed uh, elementary or junior high school called Pride housing for LGBT seniors, okay, with the full support of the government. You can't, of course, say it's only for LGBT folks, but it's a welcoming, wonderful grassroots development. I mean, the courts may be doing what they're doing, but people are changing. They're not changing as fast as we want. The 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 voices of of uh, let's go back to some mythical time in the 50s. By the way, I lived through the 50s and it was not a day at the beach, okay? Uh, <laughs> those voices are not the majority of Americans. Um, and so, and in any case, we've got to keep doing our thing, don't we? I mean, what else, you know, so. I, I think that that's a, a good place for me to sort of ask our last question and, to hear your final thoughts, um, pushes for enhanced legal protection for gender diverse people are almost always met with claims that the vindication of gender diverse people's rights are against their freedom of speech, freedom of religion, public welfare as a whole. Um, and the law has been balancing these sometimes competing or seemingly competing interests. And so I'm sort of interested in your take on each of you on how this is evolving and what we should be looking looking forward to what 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 is to come um we spend a lot of time sort of in the educational space not just studying the past and thinking about now but thinking about when you're out in practice what are we going to look for so if maybe we could go um uh attorney hill um professor ward and professor weatherby um in order and just you know how are we, how is this balancing act happening and what do we have to look for uh, on this? Uh, can I ask to pass it off to someone else so I can take a minute to think about that question? Absolutely. Okay. Professor Ward, you're up. Well, well <clears throat> uh, one of the reasons that I'm so passionate about issues of, 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 of gender identity and, and gender fluidity and uh, is because <clears throat> I think, you know, almost any movement can be co-opted. You know, the, the, the partially successful, partially failed cultural revolution of the 60s was in many ways co-opted. But one of the things about gender is it's much, 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 if that 
I believe sincerely that that this gender rigidity needs to be loosened. Okay, for the benefit of everybody, for men, for women, for people that identify all along the spectrum, and that um, it—that's the reason why it's so virulently resisted in certain quarters. But I think it's the truth, and I think if we kind of get over it, we'll all be a lot happier. That may be a very simplistic answer, but um, I think that the way that we've conceptualized—I hate to use the word, but it's true—patriarchy. Uh, is uh, uh, is is an enormous. It, it's so omnipresent that it's the sea that we swim in. We can't recognize it. But on the other hand, the, the amount of harm and and uh, that it that 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 rigid belief holds is a real stumbling block on every level, from the environment to so to social tolerance to you name it. So. Um, and I mean, I take home in the fact that I do think it's reality, that I think that humans are a lot more diverse than we would like to imagine. And that as we slowly come to get our heads around that, all of us, uh, that um, that is the way forward. I mean, I, uh, will there be storms between here and there? Of course. But, so I guess I'm a short-term pessimist and a long-term optimist. I guess that's how I would characterize myself. All right, and then, yes, I, okay, whoever unmute it first. Oh, it, either way. Do you want me to go? Go ahead. Okay. Professor Weatherby. Sure, I, I think um, I can't help but think just live and let live, you know? Um, <laughs> nobody is hurting anybody else there's no harm involved for individuals who are gender diverse or gender fluid to just be themselves um, and i think that's where we find the animus embedded in these claims of offense or um, imposition on someone's religious exercise um, and and so i don't know i i, I guess i i find that um you know, when when it's shrouded in this guise of religious freedom or religious exercise, um, there's really more to it. It's 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 crafted in animus. Um, and then the only other thing I'll say, and this is not really adding all that much, but progress is so much two steps forward, one step back, or even one step forward, two giant steps back. And, you know, we we see that even with abortion, um, with the Dobbs case. I mean, that was a, a major, major step back for reproductive rights, for for um, autonomy in personal decision making when it comes to healthcare decisions. And, uh, you know, hopefully that will change. But sometimes when we see these decisions come out of the court and it feels so helpless, it's good to look at the arc of progress and know that, you know, things hopefully will change again with social and cultural acceptance, more tolerance, more exposure. I mean, when I came to Arkansas in 2013, I had a student who saw me at a coffee shop and I was sitting with a friend who's identifies as uh, female and um, is transgender had been through the transitioning process. And the student came over to me and said, hi. And I introduced the student to my friend and I could see the students like, you know, I could see the wheels turning in her head and it was a pleasant interaction. And then that Monday she came to my office and she said, was that person transgender? I've never met one before. Those were her exact words. And I said, yes, but she's just a human like all of us. And she kind of, she was like, oh, okay, you know, <laughs> but she had never been exposed before. And I guess I'm hoping that with this generation, with more exposure, more tolerance, um, we will see that forward progress. And I guess that comes from my eternal optimism too. So, so that's all I'll say. And who knows what will happen in the future, but I think the more we talk about the issues, the more we respect each other in civil discourse, the more tolerance and acceptance and understanding will come and hopefully then the law will follow. I uh, I don't have a lot of eternal optimism, but um, one of the things you said is like, who is harmed? And I think the harm is uh, people with a tremendous amount of privilege 
feeling uncomfortable. And I think the way forward is us all getting proximate with our own biases and um, being more comfortable being uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't see how we get move forward any other way. Um, so, uh, attorney Hill, uh, your predictions for the future. Um, so, I mean, I feel like it's set up as kind of a false dichotomy that you can either have, uh, people's rights vindicated, or you can have, uh, free religion and free speech. Um, you know, you can believe whatever you want. There are no laws saying that you, um, you know, can't believe in lizard people or that birds aren't real or whatever other wild conspiracy theory. I think what bothers me is the religious preference. Um, it's not religious freedom, it's preference for a really particular lens of viewing um, Christianity or other conservative religious movements. And, you know, what I would like to see, um, in addition to kind of the court's getting back to, you can believe whatever you want, but we can still enforce these, um, you know, neutral laws that are applicable across the board to everyone. Um, and I would also like to see people who are religious people of other persuasions, you know, religious, the religious left, as they say, or people who don't belong to, you know, um, ultra conservative movements, coming out to say, well, I'm religious and this doesn't, you know, I have the freedom to practice my religion too. And, um, you know, this, this doesn't infringe on my religious freedom. Um, so I, I think those two things um, are what I, I hope to see um, in the future and in, in this area of gender equity. Yeah, very well put. Thank you to, to each of you. I love the themes of tailwinds and headwinds and steps forward and steps back and just respecting each and every person. And I'm a transgender man and a Christian man and I sleep just fine at night. So I think it's important to find the helpers and for people to speak up and um, look out for each other. So um, again, personally, thank you, Professor Weatherby, Professor Ward, Attorney Hill, for your time today and for such a up oh, and guy in the back too, and uh, for such a just made a cameo appearance. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, excellent. <laughs> Yeah, this, uh, we could go for much longer, and this has been a very productive conversation. So thank you each again for uh, attending this panel today, and I will pass it over to the Editor-in-Chief of the Law Review, Stephanie Fisher. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much to our esteemed participants and our dedicated attendees and to all of our future viewers. As we come to the conclusion of this virtual symposium event, I would like to extend my sincere gratitude to you all. Your presence here today has made the event a success and your active engagement in these enriching discussions has been so inspiring to all of us. In today's interconnected world, technology has enabled us to come together from diverse corners of the country to share insights, knowledge, and expertise. The symposium has served as a platform today for a collaborative exchange of ideas, despite these physical distances separating us. I want to emphasize that the ideas shared and the connections made during this symposium are not bound by the confines of this webinar. Furthermore, because of this format, you're able to view the entire webinar event on our YouTube channel. I would like to again thank the Roger Williams University School of Law and staff, particularly Chelsea Horn, for helping us to organize this event. I am also especially grateful to our Justice for All editor, um, Hillary Levy Friedman, and our Justice for All research and development editor, Andrea Stalen. Um, for everything they did to fill this event with such passionate and informed speakers, thank you so much. Today, we had the pleasure of hearing from a panel focusing on Title IX, and from Zakia Thomas from the ERA Coalition, and from a panel focusing on transgender rights, all of which are critical issues in ensuring justice for all. The Law Review's Justice for All issue is very young, approaching only its third year, but we have the highest hopes for what it can achieve, and we are even more hopeful for what you, the attendees, can achieve. I'd like to conclude with a few quotes that iterate that point far more eloquently than I ever could. Not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. James Baldwin. The Justice for All issue is committed to facing critical issues that need to be changed. And finally, remember, change will not come if we want for some other person or some other time. 
We are the ones that we have been waiting for. We are the change that we seek. Barack Obama. If you attended today or you're watching this recording, you are the change we seek and you are the people we have been waiting for. I hope you found today informative, instructional, and inspiring. And we thank you for supporting our mission.